Okay, everybody seems to be here, so I guess we'll uh, get our meeting for Monday, June 18th. We'll call a meeting to order. Um, everybody's reviewed the uh, agenda. Um, first thing we'd like to do is approve the agenda. So, I mean, yes, dear. Do that almost immediately then, um, after we get through the consent agenda and the public. Anything else? Okay, seeing nothing, uh, somebody make a motion to uh, approve the agenda, please. I will move that we approve the agenda with that one additional item. Motion has been made and seconded to approve the agenda. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay, the consent agenda items. It uh, looks like all it is is the minutes for May 21st meeting. If somebody would like to approve that as well. I will make the motion that we approve the consent agenda items as listed. Second. I'll second that. Okay. Motion has been made and seconded to approve the consent agenda. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Public. Is there anybody here from the public that wishes to speak at this point? Seeing none, we'll move on to Carla's request. Quick claim release. Do you need a motion? done this several times in the, <clears throat> in the recent past. There's really no need the property was probably um, set aside for the town for perhaps a school, school. House or something like that. Um, we haven't needed those for a long time in those kind of places. Um, so just for information, I believe the legislature passed a law this year that uh, once July 1st comes, we won't have to do this anymore, uh, but they want to close before the 1st of July, so we work with the lawyer and help get them this information. Okay, so the motion you need is to uh, approve the town clerk to sign the release. Just sign the quick claim deed. Uh, so moved. Is there a second? I'll second that. All right. That's... Fairly quick and easy. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Uh, do we need a quorum there, Lefty, for you guys to proceed? We have a quorum. We only need oh, two. Right, two. <laughs> we don't know where Lefty is. So all right. We'll strike a column, but he doesn't get that one. So it looks like uh, we're going to be witnessing a presentation by Mr. Scott Newman for of... Um, Waterbury Village Historical District Survey. Um, yes, I need to uh, call the meeting of the Village Trustees to order a joint session um, here for Monday, June 18th. Um, the trustees uh, asked to have this meeting with the select, the select board to uh, brief them on something that the trustees had been working on. Uh, we tried two weeks ago with uh, that meeting didn't come off as planned there to brief you on the process and then Scott Newman has a presentation. Um, and this is an outgrowth of what the uh, trustees learned after, uh, you know, working in the recovery from Irene that 
um, houses in the historic district, if they were damaged greater than 50% of a building value, um, and they weren't in the historic district, they would have to be raised above um, the flood level. But if you were a historic house in the <coughs> historic district, you were exempt from that. And uh, there were a number of buildings down on South Main Street that were constructed before homes uh, located on Randall Street and things that weren't necessarily exempt. Uh, so that in looking at after we had recovered, um, I think about a year ago, we uh, did an RFP for a contract with uh, Scott Newman that the uh, state wanted to have a resurvey of the district and things before expanding the historic district. So. Um, Scott has done that, and uh, Steve is going to brief you more on the process, and we have a letter here uh, tonight after you see the process that I would ask the trustees to uh, agree to sign um, to the state, uh, Devin Coleman, um, the His Division of Historic Preservation that's submitting this uh, Data would be coming in, but after the village goes away in two weeks, it will be, you know, the town's historic district and any follow-up process um, that needs to be. So, um, I don't know if you want to say more about the process, Steve. Or sure, I'll just add a few things. Um, is the mic on? I can't tell. So the town. The light has to be green. Right. Okay. Good. That hopefully will come on. So the town and village have five historic districts. Uh, the Waterbury Village Historic District is the largest one. They were all nominated for inclusion in the state and the Federal Register of Historic Places in the 1970s. And there have been no updates since then for these uh, five historic districts. So uh, the trustees asked staff to uh, hire a consultant to update the village historic district. And this is, um, there's a map that I've distributed that shows um, not only the current village historic district, but um, three areas where we're proposing to expand that historic district. One is on South Main Street. And um, here's an extra copy if someone wants to pass it around or, or Anne can share it. Uh, there's an extra one right here. Or if you want to pass that around, maybe ever would like to look. So uh, the areas that we're proposing for expansion are um, are Good South are um, South Main Street to, um, to all the way down to the current uh, Maplewood convenience store. Uh, this is the area that's uh, virtually all within the hundred year floodplain and would benefit from this um, historic designation for all the structures that are. Um, eligible or would be contributing structures. Uh, there's another area on Union Street. Uh, if you envision going past the, uh, what used to be called the Squire House, going towards the roundabout, Union Street dips down. And as soon as you get to the bottom of the dip, you're in also back in the 100-year floodplain. So there's about, uh, there's one non-historic house there, and then there's a series of about four historic houses that um, have also been uh, surveyed by Scott, and he'll tell you more about that process in a few minutes. And then the fourth area is one that the state requested that be included, and this is up near Thatcherbrook Primary School. It's a large block that's bounded by Railroad Street, uh, Stowe Street, High Street, and Hill Street. And uh, there are uh, many historic homes in that area and um, Devin Coleman, who is the state historic preservation architect, uh, requested that that area be included. So we expanded the project. Uh, Swayze Court is the other area. Uh, Stowe Street all the way up um, to the area down in front of the school where Mark Fryer used to live. That was already part of the historic district. So um, this area is included on the map. Uh, the process is basically a two-step process. Um, Scott's been consulting with Devin uh, for the past, what, Scott, maybe six weeks or more. Um, and we consulted with Devin even before that. Um, and there's been a lot of back and forth. It's a very interactive process. And um, 
so the first step is to go to the state. Um, the state actually um, puts in a warning for the district, and we'll be sending a letter in conjunction with the state to all of the property owners um, in conjunction with that process. That's optional, but I think it would be a very good idea. I don't think we want to be uh, proposing something without um, knowledge of those homeowners. Uh, we have notified some of the owners in the expansion areas on South Main Street and Union Street already early on in the process to talk about the, the pros and cons. And um, so on, on or about July 26th, uh, it, this uh, will be posted. And um, this is a state process. And then the um, homeowners will be notified. We can have a public meeting. That's also optional to uh, explain. And then once that process is complete, um, Scott, maybe you can just add there's a, a state uh, historic preservation commission, right, that needs to give it their blessing? The state advisory council. Advisory council. And I've got a slide on the process. Great. OK, so Scott's going to pick it up from there, I think. And then ultimately it goes to the National Park Service, to the federal government. And uh, if all's well, they give it their blessing. And we're looking at a, approximately the end of the year to wrap up that process. So um, I think rather than me delving into more, we can take questions later. But I'd like to ask Scott to come up, uh, give his presentation. And then we want to leave um, a good 15, 20 minutes uh, for some uh, back and forth discussion and question and answer. Come on up, Scott. Yeah. 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 Is that working? Yeah. Um, I was going to go down Fountain Street, and there was a sign there, and I had to back up. I mean, maybe four, and then as far as the general one commences, the church commences. So thanks for the opportunity. Uh, this is a deja vu for me, for some of you also, so I apologize. A lot of this, uh, some of you have seen already. You have to talk. Uh, you have to talk. You might want to just take it out of the rack and hold it, all right? How's that? Is that, is that okay? Yep. Thank you. Okay. Um, but thanks for the opportunity to come back and update the select board. I know that the town and the village are going through some changes, and I think that's why we're here sort of uh, <coughs> doing this. And, um, most of this is going to be very much the same as last time, only we've got a couple of updated numbers. Um, so why don't I uh, jump in? Um, this, uh, this town's village certainly no uh, stranger to me. I was the historic preservation officer for VTrans when we were doing all the permitting of the Main Street project, which, and I've been out of VTrans for a few years, but I, it sounds like that's coming right along. Well, it's, mm -hmm. That's good. Uh, we're certainly trying to trying to push that. And I want to thank Steve uh, Busbeach, and I want to thank Skip also for all the help and support and guidance that we've been pushing through this. This is a big district um, on the Vermont scale with over 300 properties. And some of those properties have multiple properties within them. So this is a pretty complex undertaking. And I uh, really needed this, the, uh, the support of Village, um, the Historical Society, and uh, certainly Skip, who seems to have an information and a story on every single building in the village. Um, it's safe to say that, that um, the state overall is behind in its national register listings. They really never have enough resources or people to do what they'd like to do. Um, the most recent updates in the state have included Montpelier and White River Junction. Stowe is underway, um, and so is the Shelburne Falls Historic District. Uh, just a couple of other towns, so you can sort of see where you are relative to other towns of Vermont. Um, Bennington was done in 2008, has not been updated. Uh, Rutland was done in 1980, and only a very small portion of the downtown. So the vast majority of, of Rutland town has not been surveyed 
for the National Register. Uh, Montpelier was just done in 2017, and that, um, that district took 14 years to complete. So by comparison, you're doing very well here, probably a little over a year, I think, to get this one done. The town of Winooski has no National Historic Register District at all, which is really surprising, and I think it's tough on towns like that with urban cores that have no uh, historic districts. And Brattleboro was done in 2004, and they've really only got a small historic district. So that is to say that Waterbury is kind of, you know, on the, on the statewide context, kind of ahead of the curve in redoing um, its National Register district. I'd really like to put this in. Just tip it up, Scott. So what is the National Register for Historic Places? Um, read this if you like. I'm not going to recite it. I can give you um, a couple of the highlights of the, uh, of the district. It's, it's honorific, meaning there is no, um, there's no encumbering regulations that come along with being listed in the National Register. You can list your property in the Register today, and you can demolish it tomorrow. Um, its advantages um, are more along the lines of planning, uh, tourage, excuse me, <laughs> tourism and heritage tourism, uh, economic development. It's certainly good for community engagement. Uh, the care taken by local governments is often reflected in how the citizens care for their communities in Vermont. Um, it's very valuable for historic tax credits, and that's a 20% credit. Um, that you get back from the federal government on qualifying expenses for income producing buildings. Um, anybody, you can go to the website of the state of Vermont and get more information, a list of consultants who can help you out with those, those projects. And I don't know if you, oh, well, you did mention this, Steve, the relief from having to, to raise your building uh, to meet flood ordinances. <clears throat> So again, there are no restrictions that come with, with, the, uh, with the register. And I think as you move forward, you'll undoubtedly hear from some of your residents, well, does this mean I can't paint my house, or I can't put on vinyl siding, or uh, I can never change my windows and that sort of thing. And it really, it doesn't mean anything of the sort. Those ordinances typically come from the municipal level. So that would be something that the town would, uh, would generate um, and have some, con some controls over its, over its building stock, but nothing in the National Register. I think that the letter that ultimately goes out to the, to the residents will, will state as much. So here is the, uh, the cover page of the last listing. It was completed in 1978, as Steve said. It was done by Terry Winters, a graduate of Columbia University. Um, she's since gone. I think she's working in D.C. in marketing now, no longer in preservation. And um, Ms. Winter's nomination was, <clears throat> was really helpful in some ways, many ways, I guess, in, in some of the history of the buildings. And in other places, it was quite confusing because she has references to a number of buildings that have been demolished or altered. Um, Many of the properties on her map didn't have addresses, so there was a lot of sleuthing that had to be done to kind of sort out um, you know, which building that she was talking about. And I, I hope that in contrast, um, you know, the way we do it today is a, is a little more user friendly, I hope, sort of an updated map and descriptions. So this is uh, Ms. Winter's map, and as you can see, it has 187. Uh, properties, including the state hospital complex, which is down in that in that U shape. Um, it's common that these older districts did not include the entire village, and uh, that's for an, a number of reasons. And there doesn't really seem to be uh, much sort of rhyme or reason to why they cut off the district in areas. But in this case, we have some understanding of why the district stopped uh, short uh, on the north and the south. And by the way, for my nomination and for the purposes of clarity so people can retain their sanity, um, Main Street runs north-south. And it's really off kilter, but if you can imagine calling the northwest facade and the southeast facade of these, I mean, it, it's just, uh, it's not really doable. So simplicity's sake, 
Um, we've got north and south, which made it really quite clear to describe which sides of which buildings we were talking about. So why did it stop to the north? Um, they, considered, they considered it there was too big a gap and the loss of continuity as it approached the roundabout. Um, in 1970s, you really wanted to have a district that was very continuous. We look, it's a more liberal interpretation of that today. We allow for, for uh, bigger gaps. Uh, same reason on the south where it stopped, just south of uh, Batchelder Street. They considered there were too many modern intrusions. And if there were two or three in a row, they would stop the district short. Um, Swayze Court was, was left out. You can see it just goes up slow and doesn't go north along Swayze. And the reason for that was the buildings in there in the 1960s. And in 1978, they were not 50 years old, and so the survey stopped. Um, there were also several emissions within the village in that 1978 survey. Um, Parker Court was not done. Warner Court was not done. Most of Moody Court, most of Batchelder Street. And I can talk about those uh, places in a little bit of detail later on. So what was the scope of work um, that I received? And this is generally out of the RFP. That's really to update the, the 1978 nomination. But 1978 was so incomplete, for all intents and purposes, this is a complete redo. Um, all of the descriptions, the photos, the maps are really redone from scratch. And there's very, sort of little reliance on, um, on what was done in 1978. And you can see that, uh, as I think Steve showed this map earlier, um, did you show this map earlier? Uh, I think we did in our first presentation. Yeah, okay, we did in the first one. So this shows the expansion areas that the village asked me to look at initially, off to the north and to the south. So as Steve mentioned, going on the north was just a, a small section of Union Street, and on the south was um, south along South Main Street, um, all the way to River Road. It also included uh, Batchelder Street, Healy Court, Derby Lane, and River Road. So, you know, this was the expanded area that I was asked to look at. So there are a few other areas that we added to the survey. Um, and again, as alluded to earlier, after spending some time in the district, uh, it became clear to me we needed to look at this neighborhood that is bound in blue right there. <coughs> that was alluded to earlier. This was not part of the original scope, but it appeared to be contiguous with the historic district. Um, certainly was related to enterprises that depended on the rail for raw materials and to ship products out of Waterbury. There's some workers housing, um, several buildings owned by the last block company that made shoe blocks from the mills at, uh, at Mill River. So I, based on the information that I gleaned out in the field, I consulted with the state in the states, you know, after seeing the photograph, said yes. Not only do we want you to include this this part uh, in the district, you need to include this in the district. If you don't include it, the National Park Service won't accept it. Uh, won't accept it, and they'll send you back to the drawing board. And so, um, I do want to say I appreciate the, the you know the quick response and turnaround by the by the village. To uh, I mean, really, within a few days, we had incorporated this, and then we sort of hit the ground running on it and added it to the survey. So here's the 1978 map, and you can see some of the changes that are added. The additions are um, bound by the green boxes that were added, and these green boxes are apart from the official uh, expansions that I was asked to look at to the north and south. And you can see again, uh, we've got Hope Cemetery um, on the far left, then Parker Court, then just up tucked, you know, beside the, um, the state complex is Warner Court, up there Moody Court, and I guess that's, that's it. And again, for some reason, 1978, they just stopped short and didn't go down these small cul-de-sac courts to, uh, to survey all the buildings. The state hospital complex, um, after Irene, there was, uh, you know, you all know more about it than I do, but there was a big project to, uh, to rationalize the use of, of buildings in the complex. Um, a number of them were demolished, others were rehabilitated, and as part of the mitigation for loss of the historic buildings, uh, 
the uh, a national register, a separate national register district was completed for the state complex, and that was listed in 2016. So as part of my work, I did not resurvey it. It's already done, but it will be a subset of the new village uh, historic district. If anybody has any questions, this kind of moves along. Feel free to feel free to ask. On the current map, what are the black buildings versus the ones that are white? Because there's no key alleged. No, that the, the the key will be in the you know in the final cop, but the black are non-contributing. Okay. Yeah, so either they've lost their historic integrity by alteration or they're just not old enough for the modern buildings. Okay. Okay. So just, you've probably seen this, but this is the, uh, the new map for the state complex historic district. And again, this is, this is now a subset of my work and included in the map and the, the uh, descriptions and so on. So what was challenging in, in, uh, for this project was to generate a base map. I mean, for historic districts, it's really all about the mapping. And uh, these are three maps that I originally found. I think the lower one is the Mylar map that the village maintained, and that's from the 70s? 90s, actually. Oh, excuse me, 90s. Yep. So that has the property lines, and I think that was just a little bit too busy for our purposes. Once I added on more lines and more numbers, I think it would have been just, you know, almost sort of unreadable. The, uh, the top two got the Regional Planning Commission. And they are um, in the middle of a project to map footprints of buildings all across the state of Vermont. And I think they're still in the beta mode. As you can see, a lot of these buildings, I think this is done by a machine that reads the building footprints uh, from the air. So that's why none of these are really rectangular. And there was some consideration given to using this as a base map. And then I think it just would have been sloppy, I think, to, to have this. It would have been maybe a close approximation, but I don't think it would have been a product that the village or town would have been proud of as its, uh, as its base map. So what we did instead was basically just use um, a combination of highway maps and, and Google map information to generate a two-scale map, which is the one on, that you've been handing out, one up in the upper left. And um, all those building footprints were added by me you know, by hand on the computer, including the state complex. And that was fairly easy to do using Google map, combination of Google Maps and what the Regional Planning Commission provided. And uh, that includes uh, every main building includes every, I hope, there may be a couple that are missing, but the garages. And the state asked me to include every garage uh, and every barn in the village. And that was uh, no easy task because I need to stay in the right of way. And a lot of these garages are we're buried behind the trees, behind people's buildings and so on. So I really can only um, just look at the map and then look down the driveway and uh, see. But I, I believe I've got all of them. Um, so this is basically a low resolution screenshot. That, you know, the, the final product is a digital image, which is crystal clear. And you can zoom in on it. And uh, the, the more you zoom in, the clearer it gets as far as the numbers showing. Um, so essentially, we've got a hybrid that we're using here. And it's the nice thing about this map is it's to scale, this, which is unusual in a historic district map. Most of them are sort of artist rendering type maps that are not to scale. Um, it's also, I think, when the town gets to working with the RPC and putting this information into ArcGIS, I think because this is to scale with accurate footprints, it's going to make that transition fairly easy, easily uh, accomplished. I mean, I think you could hand this map over to the RPC, and they could literally work with the footprints and put in the numbers and the boundaries so that you could have a digital layer for use in the town. Yeah, that's the uh, Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission is yeah. the organization that Scott's referring to. Um, I think they'd be happy to, to generate a layer for you. Um, in ArcMap. And down the road, hopefully, you've, 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 uh, you've got a system where somebody be able to go into that layer, click on a building, and photographs of it would come up from the right of way. So I think that's, you know, maybe that's one or two years away. Certainly something you continue to, 
uh, to work on. So here's a close-up of the map. Just it's just again, it's kind of low resolution because it's just clipped off the screen, but you can see um, how the map is put together. Stowe Street and uh, Route 2 Main Street here, Parker Court on the low right. So, I mean, these four buildings, for example, these four buildings right here, these sort of little 19th century buildings were not included on the last map, but now they are included with photographs and descriptions and so on. Um, so this would kind of give you an idea of what you can, what you'll be able to get on your computer screen. Uh, let's see, this to Jane's question, the unshaded buildings are con considered uh, historic structures and the shaded buildings are considered non-contributing, um, either due to age or alteration. Uh, the numbers that you see, I mean, I generated these numbers uh, for the district in, in cooperation with the state. And these numbers will um, refer you to the photograph and also the building descriptions. Uh, the 911 addresses are also included in there, so you can cross-reference between an address and, and what we've done here. Uh, you can see some of these. Do we see any? Of, like on the bottom on the left, 216A, 241A. So those are ancillary buildings to main, uh, to main houses. And those, again, you can look those up, and you've got photographs and descriptions of those as well. So as far as generating the descriptions, um, you know, I've been through maps. I want to talk a little bit about descriptions and then about photos, so how this was generated. And this is what I got from the, uh, from the village, uh, was the top database. Um, and then I modified that database on the right to go out in the field and actually take my field notes. And then you can see a copy of the, you know, what that actually looks like. So this is kind of how the sausage is made by the historian out in the field. Um, and I think I noted this last time. But you can see a little happy face right there that I drew. I had no idea that was in there. And that's because I have two over two windows with original four light storm wood windows. So the historian writes a little happy face there because he's happy all the historic stuff is still there. And the reason you need to go out and talk about uh, roof, walls, windows, foundation, features, and photos is because you really can't tell the difference between vinyl and clapboard and photographs often. Some of the vinyl is so cleverly detailed and, and sized that it's kind of tough. So uh, the same thing goes for the windows. So those calls were made out in the field standing in front of the building. Photographs. Um, I took about 1,500 photographs in the expanded district, about five or six per building. Um, each photo is connected to its 911 address in the file name, as you can see. So up at the top, you'll see Elm 2 has, what? six photographs, then L3 has a bunch, and, and so on. And all of these are on a flash drive that will be the, the property of the town. So literally anywhere in the district, you can uh, plug in the address and you can turn up five or six photographs of each property. Uh, not all five photos will be in the nomination. That would make it too loud. There'll be one, one or two photos of each one. Um, so I think hopefully that concludes kind of the text heavy part of the presentation. We get some photos. So the 1978 nomination, again, 170, uh, excuse me, 187 properties. And that nomination only had 35 black and white photographs with it, which is pretty limited in terms of looking at, looking at that as a historical snapshot of the village. Uh, the 2018 nomination has 305 properties and there are 450 digital color photographs, which you already have. Um, I gave, I gave the, the village a, a link to that. And so instead of streetscapes, as you can see in 1978, each house um, has at least one three-quarter shot, such as this 1930s bungalow, I think that's on Randall Street. Um, just an example, some of the other photos, you'll still have some streetscape shots, like the lower left. Um, and the lower right, which is uh, Winooski Street, which shows two uh, sort of 18, 20, 1830 buildings, really some of the oldest buildings of Waterbury. And then on top, I, some buildings that have interesting details, there'll be a close-up shot of that detail included. Um, 
in, for example, the one on the, these are both on Randall Street, and the one on the left has a, a pretty significant Queen Anne style gazebo. The one on the right, it has a, um, a conical roof turret with curved glass, which is, I think, the only example of that in the village, and really one of very few examples in the state. Finding curved glass um, is usually res reserved for um, what for an extraordinarily uh, high style building, and it's interesting to see that on this uh, this beautiful residence right here on Randall. So, if it was interesting and very unique, we called it out. This is again, this is just before and after 1978. This was kind of your typical description um, for this house. Again, at the end of what at the south end of uh, Randall Street. And so this is what they had in 78, and then this is a, the Mike 2018 description, which goes into more detail. And as a historical record, it'll just provide um, a, a more complete analysis of that house. It's a little bit jargon heavy, I understand that, but I think what I want to do here is, is explain a little bit about these descriptions. A lot of times, with National Register descriptions, people ignore the descriptions because they think, well, it was written by some stuffy architectural historian and, you know, I really won't be able to understand it. It's not that interesting. But um, this is just kind of a sample. So I just want to go through this really quickly because I really like for the folks in Waterbury of their houses and their communities to go through these and be able to understand them. I mean, that's just the, sort of the whole point. So wood frame, we know it's a wood frame structure as opposed to a steel frame or uh, reinforced concrete, one and a half story in self-explanatory. That's one story and then another story that's in the gable. Um, gable front simply means that its gable is facing the road as opposed to the, the longer side, which would be an eaves front. Um, side hall plan, that, all that means is the front door is on the side. Uh, duplex means you'll probably see two entrance doors on the front of the building. It has clapboard siding, an asphalt shingled roof, and a ridge chimney just means as a chimney uh, penetrating the roof uh, right at its peak. A facade porch. Well, the front of the building is always its facade, and so all that means is a porch is going to run along the, uh, the street side of the building. Tuscan columns. Tuscan is just round. Uh, fancy way of saying a round column. It that just means that they narrow at the top. They rest on a shingled half wall. Well, there are dozens and dozens of, of houses in Waterbury with Tuscan columns that rest on shingled half walls, which is just kind of your, um, what do you call it, instead of having a railing, it's enclosed and it's covered in shingles. Um, what do we have here? An entrance pediment just means a little gable um, over the porch. Do six over one picture window. That's pretty, the, the, the top part of the window is split in six and the bottom is one. Corner boards rise to meet open eaves. Open eaves just means, and, you know, you'll, you'll have the, uh, you, you can see the rafters. Instead of them being enclosed, you can see them. And it's decorated with sawn verge board. Oh, but we, we talked about this gingerbread. I think somebody brought up last time. That's the more common name of the verge board. And exposed rafter tails. Windows, four appearing in the game. So, if you get sort of good at this game, you could draw this house pretty accurately from this description, and that's pretty much exactly what it'll look like. You see the pediment, the little pediment over the, uh, the entrance. You can see the, the verge board, the ridge chimney, the gable front, one and a half stories, um, Tuscan columns on the shingled half wall. So really, there's, there's not much um, um, there's not really that much mystery in these descriptions if somebody wants to go through it and sort of figure out how it's done. Where's the six over one picture window? It's on the, well, I can see it on my screen. You don't see it very well there. You see that? Oh, I really work. You see those six lights, right? It's split into six pieces over one. Yeah. Yeah. So the big window on the left has six small panels over a, a larger panel. Um, and I had an idea, really, to, with an easel and with this description, just to draw the building in a public meeting so that, you, so that you, you can easily do this. And I'll draw the building, and then I'll show you what it actually looks like, and it'll be pretty similar. Um, so we talked about garages. Well, this is kind of new. We never did garages before. 
Um, and this is kind of an example of what garage from maybe least historic to most historic, starting on, let's say, the top left. Uh, so this one's been substantially altered. It's covered in, I think it's covered in asphalt shingles. The door has been changed, and really um, sort of the historic integrity is kind of shot. Um, at 20 Randall, this kind of, it's kind of interesting. It's got a gambrel roof, so which means yeah, it's probably from the 1930s. But it's got a new door, and it's got vinyl siding. Um, the lower left has a nice hip roof to it. It's got, I think that's got uh, open rafter tails. I can see on my screen. I think you can see them just below the roof edge. Yep. And um, the original door locations, if not the original door. And then a really uh, interesting garage at 27 North Main. And these really are diamonds in the rough. And I don't think these get enough attention, these garages. Uh, this one has its four over four double hung window with all its trim in the top. It has eave returns, which just mean sort of a Greek revival detail that comes back here. It's got a freeze board and corner boards, wood siding, original wood doors. I mean, these are kind of rare. And, you know, I haven't spoken to the folks, and I really, you know, as a historian, I hope they're not going to knock it over or, or make drastic changes. It'd be nice to, for some folks, once they look at this, to say, wow, what I've got here is pretty special. You know, I ought to paint this thing and, and keep it repaired. This is a historic garage. <coughs> and eligible. I mean, this garage would be listed in the National Register of Historic Places. So, uh, you know, that might be kind of cool for the owner. Here's another new type of property we're looking at here, which we didn't look at in 1978. These are minimal traditional style. Uh, Post-war housing, typically one story, very simple. Um, maybe an L plan with a few pediments on it. These are going to be included in the National Register as being over 50 years old and retaining uh, historic integrity as well, sort of architectural, um, representing architectural styles in the late 1950s and 1960s. The, the lower left has a nice detail of the corner window. You really don't see those windows often except in, in the, uh, the 1960s. So Scott, the, yeah. the documentation about these buildings get into uh, any uh, literature on who the original owner was or any aspect of some do built. some do i mean the more important buildings particularly in the commercial downtown they'll talk about the uh, you know who it was built for um who the architect was and the builder which is william will deal built a lot of those um, Skip provided a bunch of information on buildings that have been moved and you know for whom they were built and so on. So where we have it, where it's accessible, we'll certainly include it. Um, but for 305 properties, we're not sort of doing a deed, deed research on each one. I mean, it would, the cost would be um, sort of astronomical to hire somebody to do that. So. We do what we can. I think as you, as you read the nomination, hopefully that information is there for the, you know, the really significant uh, structures. These buildings right here, typically not, although I, there's one on Swayze Street that was built for Mr. Swayze, you know, sort of something like that is going to be called out. Well, this just uh, compares the 1978 and the uh, 2000, uh, 2018 nomination. Again, at the top, 187 properties versus 305 plus garages. This number is kind of interesting, the next one down. Out of the 187, um, 34 were non-contributing, which gave you an 18% non-contributing. In 2018, 56 were non-contributing still 18% non-contributing. So the overall integrity of the district has pretty much remained the same as, uh, you know, between then and now. Which, I think, that's a good sign. Uh, a really good sign, in fact, because often it actually decreases. Um, the building, you know, I noted the buildings here that have been removed, either by demolition or fire, and I think we've got one to add. And actually, I was in, the, in part of the <laughs> village they like coming down railroad uh, street, and the building that I had surveyed just a few weeks before was gone. <laughs> yeah. So, we'll uh, certainly we'll make a note of that. But there'll be a picture of it in the nomination, and underneath it'll say demolished 2018. 
And at the bottom there are just a list of buildings that were included in 1978, but for whatever reason, they're no longer included because there have been too many changes. As you can see, a bunch of them are on Randall, up on the, uh, the south end of Randall there. Each one of those um, has a, definitely has a story. So here's the nomination status. I think Steve will answer some of the questions that we were talking about. This has been updated um, since the last presentation. And if you look down at the bottom, well, the top shows you where, you know, what I've done. And everything's already complete or it's drafted and we're, we're working on it with the state. Um, but the, the timeline is listed in the bottom and working back, the December 15th is the target date to have it listed, and so you can put up your plaques and have the party and um, do all that. Um, and that's provided when we submit to the National Park Service by October 15th. Um, before that, the Vermont Advisory Council needs to have reviewed it. Before that, we need to have sent the letters out to the, that Steve was talking about, the letters out to all the water group property owners. And then before that is all the work that, that I've got to do to finish up with the state and get it done. So I don't see any reason why this isn't done by the end of the year. Uh, we've had a couple of extensions. One was because we added a neighborhood, and then the other one was added just because it's taking longer than I thought, which is, that's kind of good news, bad news. Um, you're getting more work for the same money with, this, with the second extension. Uh, it's certainly quite a bit to do. Um, any questions about the timeline here on this? She, if you look at the DHP letters to Waterbury property owners, that actually doesn't need to happen on July 26. It needs to happen a month before the next one. So that could happen sometime in August as well. So we've got some, some buffer to work with there to still meet the, the timeline. Yeah, I think we're, we are gonna wanna reach out to property owners. Um, as when this goes public, I think that's an appropriate time to let the property owners know. That would be my recommendation. And, um, you know, we, we want to make sure that uh, this is a transparent process. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention in this process is that, uh, as we all know, the village is going to uh, be going away at the end of June. So um, the, the way we have it set up is that the uh, village would authorize the submittal and then uh, the town would uh, would take it over. Um, there's a lot of flexibility on how these uh, districts, a lot of different ways, as I understand it, how these districts are uh, nominated locally, but uh, that's the process that we would envision. And then uh, any any follow-up, uh, we're hoping that the select board will agree to uh, sponsor follow-up. Uh, most of that would be done at the staff level. What uh, questions as they go through the review are the uh, state or the uh, other entities likely to have just questions on a building or why did you do this or yeah they might ask for you know, why did you, exactly why did you add that neighborhood um, who'd you talk to how did you justify those boundaries um, you know why did you add those 1960s properties can you tell us a little bit more about that um, why didn't you extend onto the other side of the roundabout to capture that the, the north neighborhood um, they might ask for more you know did i include more information on a particular property i don't really think we're going to have that issue here um, because i've been uh, working with the state sort of checking in at key points so by the time we get to the advisory council um they should already know we should have you know we'll we'll have unless something really comes out of left field we'll have the the, the answers to the questions that they ask there but they're obliged to uh, you know that's their job to ask questions so they'll have some for sure yeah, we did actually send a letter out, I think, to all the property owners with the exception of the expansion area, just to let property owners know that uh, Scott would be taking pictures, uh, even though they're all from the public right away. And I think you only had one or two property owners that uh, were either surprised or raised. I, I had, there was one that objected Jackson. strenuously to my taking pictures of the house, but boy, I, I mean, people were incredibly friendly and helpful. A couple invited me inside to look at photographs and this and that. I did not, um, had a lot to do, but people were really, really, really nice and 
uh, accommodating, because who wants to have some person out in the street taking pictures? We, for that reason, I, you know, I wore a yellow vest and um, clipboard and all that, so. It, I think it went really, really well. I mean, I've done other districts where they've been, you know, didn't go quite smoothly. Uh, do you want to update yes, us? That, that's fine. Fair loop? <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> I think I just got a couple more slides. I okay, we'll wrap it up. Um, you know, some of this stuff is just interesting. There's the Waterbury Inn that burned in 1953 in the in the top left, and then this bank um, was built in its place. And Devin Coleman really liked that bank. He thought that was a really kind of curvy, very nice mid-century type architecture. We call it the Moroccan Embassy. No. Dropped into Waterbury. <laughs> And he told me the day he was driving along and it just turned into the one in the, in the, the bottom here. He was disappointed. You can sort of see that the, that the one on the top right has a kind of streamlined, um, uh, you know, roller skating, bringing your tray to the car window kind of look. Uh, yeah, it was pretty, pretty sharp structure. Of course, so, so was the inn. Um, here's just the before and after of the, of the block on Stowe Street here. And, um, you know, we'll include some of these historic photographs just to show this is a wonderful restoration of that building. Uh, I'm guessing this was a tax credit. Yeah, project. it was. Yeah. And so when you've got a tax credit project in your town, that's really good news because it drives economic development. It really does a nice job uh, on the, uh, the historic restoration. You can see what an asset that is, obviously. They put back these coins up in the corner. You see that the corner that's closest. Those are just called coins, Q-U-O-I-N-S, which is just um, kind of a Greek revival sort of pilaster feature. But they put those back, and um, it's really kind of a wonderful job. And here's the you know, three iterations of this little spot on Main Street where the, where the Allium restaurant is now. And these are sort of three generations of structures um, right there in that spot. And I gathered that the ones in the top right burned in 80, mid 80s, is that right? I know Skip told me and I think I forgot, but around there. And this is what, so again, that's kind of an evolution. And this is unusual because most of the historic building stock uh, remains. That was before and after of the building on uh, Randall Street. And you can see in the top left all of this, the, um, the decorative shingle work that was on there, and the kind of radiating sunburst clapboards up in the gable. I mean, really kind of an extraordinary amount of woodwork. And, you know, over time, these things get removed in favor of uh, vinyl siding. And, you know, there's a lot of vinyl siding in Waterbury, but there's also a lot of clapboard siding. Um, but I suspect, looking at a bunch of these buildings, that the clapboards remain underneath the vinyl, and maybe there'll be a trend in the town to, to start taking it off at some point. So this is just a kind of a random, um, a random collection of notes, just to finish off. A very high degree of historic integrity, with you know really remarkably well-maintained well -maintained buildings throughout. Uh, good streetscape integrity, uh, mature trees, lining. Um, particularly South Main Street, are really nice. I hope they survive the Main Street project, most of them. Um, an intact, compact downtown core, which is nice. It really hasn't sort of continued to spread too much down the street. Very few modern intrusions in the core. Great use of back lots. And Waterbury is amazing, but the lots are so deep that you see a building on the front, standing in front of it, and you get to the side, you can see that it goes back sometimes six, eight, even ten days deep with barns and, and additions and connections. Oh. For example, on Winooski Street, almost every building goes, you know, you've got the main house, big house, little house, back house, barn. And it's sort of quintessentially a Vermont architecture. That kind of stuff's going to be, you know, that's in my report. I'm trying to draw on these, um, uh, on these trends. Friendly, interested, helpful residents, that is true. Um, one over one vinyl windows, ubiquitous in Waterbury Village, and I'm really not sure why that is. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure it's important for my report, but there must have been a local supplier. Good salesman. Yeah, good salesman. <laughs> 
and even on high style buildings where the buildings were probably these you know wonderful multi pane Queen Anne, they're gone in most cases, and they're one over one vinyl windows. And asbestos siding is simply in there to, that I note that a lot of it was removed, particularly on Winooski. Uh, in reading the old nomination, it said a lot of these had asbestos siding, and if you look today, they're all clapboard siding or vinyl. So, I mean, I'll get to the bottom of it. There was a program, obviously, to remove um, asbestos siding. And um, I think vinyl siding, you know, personally, I think it's, you know, as a, my, for a dozen years as a building contractor for historic buildings, it's kind of an issue. I think um, as we get into uh, 20, 30 years that it's been on, it's going to be a greater issue. Uh, it's, it's great at keeping moisture out of buildings, but it's great at keeping moisture in, uh, trapped behind it, where insects and, and who knows what can play havoc. And I've been part of a number of projects where they removed the vinyl, and there was uh, uh, some trouble underneath on varying degrees. So um, once you get a tax credit project going, you can take off the vinyl and get 20% back. So that's, that's kind of it. And as you can see, I, I'm not showing you the, the, the results of the survey because it was a select board meeting sort of showing you more about the process of, uh, of how it was put together. Do we have more questions? Uh, I'd like to ask one. Uh, just wondering if the Historical Society can get a complete copy of the report. So yeah, absolutely. I think we want to get it in a more final, a bit more final form. Yeah, when it's done. When it's done, yeah. yeah. I think that, that's that, would that, is that what you would recommend? That's, I think that's the discussion we had that they, before it was the formal report went to the state, mm -hmm. that, the, the, that the town and the historical society will amend it and okay. say yes, we agree. Great, okay. thank you. That model that you put together there, the mapping model, um, that your original of yours? Yes. And uh, do you think you would uh, possibly use it? Same, same type of model? And would I use that in, for other nominations, do you mean? Or yeah. Would that work in other towns like you? you know? I think it would. I mean, face, facing, you know, with the same circumstances, I'd do the same thing again. Um, if you look at the old nomination, it just, you know, regardless of the building, it just had the same size square. So if it was a, you know, 100 feet long, it still had the little square. Um, and you have sort of like more to scale footprints. The state likes it. <laughs> They're the deciders. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank yeah, you. thanks for the work. So, Chris, what, maybe, maybe if I could make just one more comment. Sure. This uh, mic keeps going off. Um, as uh, we mentioned before, we've uh, prepared, staff has prepared a letter for the trustees um, that will go to Devin Coleman. And um, Bill and Skip suggested that I draft a letter for the select board that is basically a letter of support and concurrence. And um, it also mentions a commitment to follow up. So it's a draft. Um, I'd like you to take a quick look at it. Maybe Bill has some more comments about that. Yeah, I, I just want to uh, make sure everybody understands that when we suggest that the select board or the town needs to follow up, the village uh, appropriated money for this survey that Scott did a year ago. Um, it's been ongoing. The village is uh, paid for a good share of it. There will be a final payment made uh, when the project is done. The trustees, as was indicated by Scott, will be uh, approving a letter to actually go forward with this nomination process. And the, the letter from the town is just to acknowledge that the town understands that the village has done this, acknowledges the importance of the historic district, and acknowledges that the village is going away and the town will be left. There's really no ongoing obligation for spending money. So the, the town isn't going to be asked to spend anything for this going forward. I mean, we've had a historic district in the in the village and in other areas of the town since the 1970s and as scott indicated it's beneficial for the owners of the properties for a variety of reasons but there's no obligation uh, for the town to spend money so i just want to make sure you understand that 
you're supporting the concept of the project and that there's benefits that will accrue to Waterbury residents and property owners, uh, but at no expense to the taxpayer. I just wanted to say, I went to the um, Downtown Historic Preservation Conference um, a week or so ago, and Scott, I have a question for you. Uh, on one of the site, uh, like little site walks we did, it was in Bristol, they talked about the fact that Waterbury um, could at some point apply for another, I, I can't remember the name of the group, it's like a designation that would uh, allow them to get um, grants. Uh, it was like the $60,000 available. Maybe Steve certified. can tell me. Yeah. Uh, certified. This is a certified local government program. Right. And um, it's a uh, federal program that is supported by the state. Uh, we've looked into it. Um, <clears throat> the biggest hitch, maybe the batteries are going out on this mic. Um, I think I'll just speak loudly. Uh, the biggest hitch is that um, we would have to have an historic uh, commission, and I think there's some real capacity issues, so we haven't pursued it further, but it does provide funding, potentially, for uh, updates to historic districts and uh, those types of projects. Yeah, I, Devin Coleman mentioned that Stowe had gotten money for signage, like historic interpretive signage on a trail. So yeah. I asked him about it. He was mentioning it, so he was on the tour. So um, might be something we want to pursue. Yeah, that's something we can definitely continue. We probably want to work with the uh, with the historical society in uh, looking at that project. Yeah, yeah we, we, we talked about that. Um, what did you call it? Uh, it's the Certified Local Government yeah, we, we program. Talked about, we talked about that Certified Local Government program shortly after Irene, and given everything that we were trying to recover from, uh, we concluded that we really didn't have the capacity to do that now. Um, there are some fairly rigorous requirements that, uh, from a staffing perspective, it's something that if the select board is interested down the road, we can look at it again. But uh, for the time being, we decided it wasn't in our best interest to do it just because we had so many other things going on. It may have even come to the trustees, and at the time the trustees said you know, there was really no interest on their part to do that because of the, the high bar that had to be set with regard to involvement. So, so do you need a motion to consider signing this letter of support? Well, I think if the trustees approve theirs, then there's something to support. So, yeah. So, um, I make a motion to um, for the trustees to submit this letter to the Vermont Division of Historic Preservation, um, and to submit this letter, which will update the historic building survey, which is part of the application to the state and federal government, to update and expand the Waterbury Village Historic District. I second that. Um, the motion was made and seconded to send a letter to the state architectural historian expanding the uh, Waterbury Historic District and submission of the report when it's um, complete. Is there any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 So do you have an original? Yep. Yes, it's right here. here. And we'll have Lefty. Sorry, I don't know okay. what happened to him tonight. Maybe he's dealing with flooding issues, Skip. You never know. <laughs> Could be. Thank you. It's very well done. Yeah, I don't know. It was so now the staff would recommend that the staff board sign that letter of concurrence. With a motion as well? Yeah. Okay. So if somebody would like to make a motion that uh, approves, approves uh, and acknowledges the ongoing efforts of the uh, Historical Society and the update of uh, historical documentation. So moved. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay. Yeah. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 I actually have an original here, Chris. Okay. 
Well, you're doing that. I just like to thank the select board for supporting it and things. And uh, at some future date, there's one last part of the village I think that needs to be studied and included in the historic district, which is the Wallace and Butler Street area of Waterbury, which was historically known as Farrar's Edition, which was Edward Farrar. Um, bought that land and filed a subdivision plot. Unfortunately, he died probably two or three years into his project, but uh, that's a very historical area of the village that was developed all at one time and uh, deserves to be uh, surveyed and included on the, the register at some point. Um, unfortunately, well, fortunately, it's not in the 100-year floodplain, so it didn't have the significance that uh, we did this expansion here because of the exemption. But it's something to keep in mind and uh, for the future there. Very good. Chris, before you move on with the select board meeting, um, we have just a quick bit of business related to this, um, and that is that we need to extend Scott's contract to the end of July. And it uh, originally was set um, to expire at the end of June. So I have a, a uh, contract amendment here uh, to one pager. So if you could just take a look at that. And all, all it does is uh, extend uh, his contract to the end of July. And I've uh, given this to Scott as well. So if you're um, inclined to approve it, um, I would ask that you would authorize Bill to sign the contract extension and um, Bill has reviewed this as well. So this is a village? This is yeah. a village okay. function okay. because right. the contract's with the village. That's Great. correct. Yeah. So I'll make a motion to um, have the municipal manager sign this extension of uh, the contract um, to July 31st. Ju oh, July 31st. Gotcha. Thank you. And I second that. The motion has been made and seconded to extend the uh, professional services contract for 106 associates, um, extending it from July 14th to July 31st. Is there any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. So. Good. Okay, great, thank you. That's, that's, all, that's all I have. Okay. So we'll uh, adjourn the village portion of this meeting at this time at 8 11. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. It'll be our last time to visit. <laughs> yeah. As we now there's no time as trustees. <laughs> as trustees. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oops, sorry, I'm sorry. Bye now. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move on with the uh, select board business. Uh, but before we get into the manager's items, I'd like to uh, congratulate and welcome Bill into the world of Grampy uh, grandfatherhood <laughs> with, the, with the birth of a uh, newborn daughter, granddaughter in his case. Uh, so congratulations, Bill. Thanks a lot. <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, it's tough to get us get the smile off your face when your grandchildren are around. Okay, oh, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, managers' items. First thing on the list is uh, Leaf Peepers Race. Okay, so uh, Roger Krantz is here, and I can't remember your your guest. Yeah. Garrett Emerson is the founding director of the Leaf Peepers. Okay. If you want to take a seat up there at that microphone, which may or may not work. Okay. <laughs> so uh, Roger is here. I told him he didn't really need to come, but uh, he wants to uh, make sure that all of your questions might be answered. Uh, the Leaf Peepers Half Marathon um, is also a 5K run? Also a 5K, yes. Um, has taken place in Waterbury for longer than I've been in Waterbury, which is a long time. So, 
35 years. Okay. And um, it will be this October? It'll be September 30th. September this year, okay. So September 30th, same course as uh, the past few years, which is from Pilgrim Park up Sco Street. Yes, it's the same course. And then Berry Hill. And exactly the same, yes. Okay. So um, the, the biggest issue for the town is um, assurance of some public safety uh, presence. The village used to provide uh, some of the police protection necessary. The village police used to lead the race out of the community and provide some um, traffic control. The Waterbury Fire Department provides quite a bit of traffic control. So why don't you take it from there as a, and you can just fill them in on the, what you think are the high points and if they have questions they can ask. Well, yeah, we have, uh, we have 35 firefighters on the course and they calm traffic and, and they direct runners, but they, they're, they're primarily to, to calm traffic. Uh, because there are some road closures and there are some intersections where it can be tricky. We also have had in the past uh, three sheriffs, um, and we put them at strategic locations. Um, actually, um, I get together before, just before the race, I get Gary Dillon um, and his wife Sally together with the sheriffs and also the Green Mountain Bike Patrol that uh, rides along with the rides along with the race in case there's any emergencies, medical emergencies, and uh, they they decide where the sheriffs go. Um, and but um, at the beginning of the race, uh, the a sheriff leads um, the the, the uh, blue light leads the runners out up to the uh, intersection where you have that parking lot. Perry Hill and Lincoln Street. Yeah, yeah that's right. And then it comes back, he leads, uh, he leads the uh, half marathon runners out first, he comes back 15 minutes later, he, reads, he leads the 5K runners out and comes back and then he's, he's stationed somewhere along the course. Okay. Um, <clears throat> September 30th is a Sunday. Um, our contract with the state police, which we haven't executed yet, doesn't provide Sunday coverage. So the state police uh, will not be in town that day unless special arrangements are made. Um, we've really never had any major issues. Uh, you know, there's a little bit of traffic congestion that occurs. Um, you know, we, uh, some of the roads we allow, you know, one-way traffic in on Guptill Road, uh, Howard Ave, um, they race up till into Waterbury Center. And you do try to have a pre-race campaign where you get the word out to people, right? There's always a few that don't get it, and there's always a few that are a little bit, um, you know, Frustrated, evidently, you know, lack of a better word, but you do try to promote this and let the neighbors know. Yes, we have a, 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 a communications plan. I don't know if you've. I, I sent these to, to you, Bill, and, um, but the communications plan is we, we put up road signs. We have 20 road signs, and we put those up along the course. Um, the week before. It says road race Sunday 11 to 2. Uh, we put uh, notices on front porch forum. Uh, that's our main way of communicating with residents. And then we send a broadcast email to all the runners and we tell them to follow the directions of the, uh, of the firefighters and the, and the sheriffs so that they run in the proper lanes. We have a lot of the course cone and they have to run within the cones. And that's worked out pretty well in the last several years. People obey firefighters. Is there anything else in particular that you need? Want to uh, communicate? Uh, no, that's that's it. I, I would like to um, uh, tell you all that this is. I've been directing the Leaf Beaver Staff Marathon for I think 14 years now, and this will be in my last year. 
uh, I've decided to turn it over to new leadership, and uh, so there will be somebody new here next year. Okay. Good for you. And, and we make, I don't know if, if I think you know this, but uh, we do make, um, I think, significant contributions to, to the community. Last year, Harwood Union um, Boosters Club received 4,000 from us, the fire department, 2,250, the emergency services uh, unit, uh, $200 there on, on site. Thatcher Book Public School has a water station at the top of Perry Hill, and we contributed 400 to them. So we, we try to contribute to the community organizations for their help in, in running this race. And obviously it brings a lot of people into the community that go to restaurants and shop and other things like that as well. So it's, it's always been a, a good event, um, and by and large, it's been, you know, they, they put a lot of time and effort into their planning and organizing. They cover their bases. So uh, my recommendation would be for the select board to approve the Leaf Peepers Half Marathon and 5K Run for September 30th. The times are the time of the race? It, it starts at 11, okay. and it's basically over by 2. So um, in the past, the, the village has taken the lead in uh, proving this with the select board uh, coming along behind because it starts and ends in the village and there was, uh, it was the Waterbury Village Police that had to be involved as well and that's no longer the case. So I would recommend that you approve this. Would somebody like to make that motion then? I will <clears throat> make the motion that we approve um, uh, the Lead Peepers Half Marathon and 5K uh, race to be conducted in Waterbury on September 30th. Okay. Would you like to second that, Jane? I'll second that. Okay. Any further discussion? I'd just like to say I hope that you'll leave behind some kind of uh, protocol or directions for your successor because it seems like you have so much experience so that they can make a smooth transition. Yes, I'm going to leave detailed notes and uh, copies of all the letters I send people and mm -hmm. a timeline for doing stuff. It is a, a fairly complicated right. uh, process to raise this big. Okay. How many runners you. do you anticipate, Roger? Uh, we're hoping for a thousand. Great. Is that a pretty consistent number? Around a no, the numbers have been going down. Um, the hell? <laughs> <laughs> Since you moved it out of the village, the, out of the river, river road? Since we moved it out of the uh, river road, yeah. numbers have been going down. And also, road race numbers around the state and around the country are also going down. Mm -hmm. We're not quite sure why, but other forms of vigorous exercise are, um, uh, are, co are, are coming into play. Okay. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, appreciate everything, Roger. Okay, so motion's been made and seconded to approve the Leaf Peepers Marathon. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for all your effort. Thank you. Okay, we're on to the next item, which is a special event permit for Waterbury Arts Festival and Friday night block party. That must be Karen. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So just to uh, introduce, you all know Karen Nevin, who is the executive director of Revitalizing Waterbury. Uh, they have applied for a special event permit application or, or special event permit by filling out the application that we have and all of the uh, attendant um, backup documentation, which tells us, you know, what the event is going to be like. They have letters from the fire chief, from the ambulance service. Uh, they did have to get a public event permit from the Department of Public Safety, right? 
Um, they've uh, told us about their traffic control and the like. So uh, to me, all of this is in order. They've paid the fee that goes along with this. Um, and Karen's here to uh, talk a little bit more about the event and fill you in on any details. But everything that we need is here. So, um, you know, it's, you should be fairly familiar with the event. Hopefully you'll be there. Uh, July 13th and 14th, uh, this is the 17th year of the event. Um, we, uh, going through the process with the auto show, realized that we needed to complete the uh, event uh, special permit for the Waterbury Arts Fest as we've reached those numbers in the last year or so uh, to, to make it necessary. So we have completed the state permit, got that material in, and we completed this one as well. Uh, listening to your questions for the leaf papers, I thought I'd share a little bit about uh, how we communicate with the uh, community about what's happening. Uh, we recognized there were a couple of issues that we came out of last year and have made alterations and some adjustments this year to make sure um, things go really smoothly. Uh, one thing we've always done is, is share a letter with every single uh, resident or business and employee along Stowe Street and Bidwell Lane. This year, we're going to extend that communication, and, that, and particularly because we closed the street. And so one of the things is we need cars moved in time for this, the closure. So this year, we're going to um, include uh, all of Stowe Street, Union Street, Railroad Street, and then down, um, down South Main, really the block, uh, down to uh, Kathy Cummings building, um, those residents, because uh, a lot of them park in the back, but we've never communicated with them before because their door isn't on Stowe Street or Bidwell Lane. So we've increased our communication to really improve that. Another piece we've done is we've really thought hard about uh, traffic control uh, and directional and parking. So there's five um, identified municipal lots in town. We're going to put up directional signs on when, uh, not Wednesday, Friday morning, uh, that really that's identify WAF parking with an arrow, and they will be directed to five locations. This building here, um, oh gosh, I'm exhausted. I've been packing my son mm -hmm. up to move to Texas and Boston. I got home at six, so <laughs> I'm really tired. 51 South Main, the elementary school, uh, the Green Mountain Coffee Roasters train station parking lot, this building, what's the fifth one I'm thinking of? Elm Street? No. No, we're not pointing yeah, people to Elm Street. The state, oh gosh, I can't remember which one. We talked about office. going down towards the state office complex. <laughs> I'm blanking out. Last but just trust here. me, you know yeah. that they're there. And I can't, I can't remember all of them. But we're going to, they'll go to the, the uh, train station. I think Armory was the other um, parking lot. Um, we're not directing to Elm Street because it's right in the middle of town and the um, Ayers have a major event mm -hmm. and that parking is, there's only what, 12 spots there anyways, maybe 15. It is handicapped parking, it's identified as handicapped parking on our parking map, but we're not directing people there. So everyone who goes directs to these parking lots will actually, in each parking lot will be a sign that says five minute walk this way, two minute walk this way, so they know how close the parking lot is to where they're going. We're hoping that will really improve parking on Friday. Uh, we're also working with uh, BARB and VTrans liaison to communicate with the state office complex and the larger employers to encourage them to um, get the word out to their employees that when they leave on Friday to maybe go south down Route 100 to get on the interstate instead of coming up this way because of the log jam that existed last year with the lacrosse tournament also happening up in Stowe. So um, when, those, is, when is the lacrosse tournament happening? It's, it's the same in Stowe. Weekend? It's the same weekend. They have it over two weekends. It's and the first weekend. I know is, all about the lacrosse tour. <laughs> <laughs> Associated traffic. Yes. Mess. So we're working to make sure we direct traffic um, and communicate to people where everything is going on. Thank you, because I've been wondering when the lacrosse tournament. Now you know, 13th and 14th of July. There's a lot of information, public information on that. Yeah. I mean, we'll be also. Project. 
Yeah. It'll also go out on front porch forum and all our for our usual forms of communication. But the the letter to the neighbors, which we literally drop off at their doors, I think is a really effective tool. Uh, we do it three weeks before, one week before, and then put up some signs the next the day before to make sure people don't move, don't park where we need them to park. Um, the only other major uh, glitch last year was with a lot of people come a lot of garbage and we uh, have really uh, in strengthened our um, awareness of the situation and how we're going to handle it. So we'll have garbage cans, we're going to have actual volunteers who are solely in charge of trash removal, we're partnering um, with uh, John Malter and the waste management mm -hmm. people. Uh, to do uh, recycling, we'll have recycling signage and, and, and things. And then we've also, um, are, we're having a dumpster brought in at the, put at the bottom of Bidwell Lane so we can get all our garbage out um, nice and neatly. So, uh, you know, those were the two little things that came up last year that maybe the general public may not have been aware of, but we were very much aware of and think that these um, additions will really um, enhance the whole event because it has grown. Um, we're not looking to grow it much more hmm. because there's a space and capacity issue. <laughs> uh, but it is a, uh, a lot of fun. It's a great weekend. Did, uh, I was busy talking to Carla. Did you mention the porta potties? Oh, I didn't. You're right. So that's the other. So uh, actually, good point. The porta potties, um, we've also tweaked that as well in that uh, Lots of people means lots of usage, and this year we've uh, we've changed our use. Um, the company we're working with, there will be six toilets available on Friday night, two within the beer garden, so people don't have to leave the beer garden to go to the bathroom and not know what to do with their beer because that was an issue last year. And then we have some. They'll be coming in at 5:30 in the morning, removing the two from the street and. Uh, cleaning all of them out for Saturday. So we have a total refresh for the next day. And you know, it's just those little things that make a really big difference. Mm -hmm. We'll see if I put flowers inside the porta potties this year. <laughs> <laughs> I thought about it. <laughs> so the beer tent, they pay to drink it in and then pee it out. Yeah. <laughs> Seems like a waste to me. Um, haven't you? speak to all the events coming up there it just made me think that it's almost you could almost get to the point where you could do away with a calendar and just judge your season based on events you know um, it's like there i will honestly tell you that uh if if we're doing it right we know when everything is happening and a calendar you know we know nqid the the uh the uh, the arts fest auto show we got leaf peepers we've got uh different events yes uh, the makes you aware of how quick this the summer season goes you know it's like all of a sudden now you're on another event and it's before you know it'll be the holiday the stroll there and in Winterfest <laughs> now let's enjoy the summer for a little longer would there be any way to coordinate with Stowe so that the their um, lacrosse um, weekend which is such a big draw for them was on a different weekend here's the problem there's is always the second starts the second weekend of July and ours is the second weekend of July and I mean theirs has only been a few years old though it's like five years old or something it, it's just turned into this it's been around for a while I think just theirs has grown up as well and it's really hard to change an event that has become established in people's minds as being it is always here um, and yeah. you just, you know, the 4th of July is always on the 4th of July. So what I love about the NQID is you guys are smart because, or the Rotary smart is because it's a week earlier, so you get to have all those celebrations and you still have 4th of July to go through. But it's really hard to change in a All right, well, I just thought I'd put that out there. I didn't realize it was had been going on that long. I think it's just become a big deal in yeah. the last four or five it years. And it's becoming, there's a meeting that's tentatively being scheduled for next week that involves all the players mm -hmm. um, for both Stowe, Waterbury, State Police, Buildings and General Services, um, and more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just getting the word out ahead of time. And try to stagger some of the traffic. I mean, they'll be a lot closer to Stowe with the Route 100 reconstruction by then, so 
it'll be a good place to avoid that weekend, I think, for us in town. Locals usually batten down the hatches. Stay in Waterbury. I know where you should be on the 13th and 14th. Right. We know where we should be. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions? So you need a motion to approve the permit. I will move that we approve the special event permit for the Waterbury Arts Fest and Friday night block party on July 13th and 14th. I'll second that. Okay. Uh, motion been made and seconded to approve the special events permit for the Waterbury Arts Fest and the Friday night block party. All those in favor, would you please say aye? Aye. Aye. Thank you very, very Off much. Off and running, Karen. See you in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Take a break. <laughs> yeah. We'll get some rest, yes. Axel's Entertainment Permit. Yeah, so um, Axel's Gallery and Frame Shop, uh, Whitney Aldridge's establishment for the last several years have had a um, Wine in the Art in the Alley event. <laughs> and, you know, they have live music. Um, and they've always, uh, they've always sought and received the village entertainment permit for this because it's in the village and the village's ordinance, ordinances always took precedence in the village. Um, they had three events scheduled, one in June that they did get a village permit for, but their second two events are Friday, July 20th from 6 to 9, and Friday, August 24th, from 6 to 9. Um, and it really needs to be approved by the select board. Uh, the village's ordinance um, allowed me to uh, approve these, um, but the town ordinance says the select board has to approve it. Uh, we've never had any problems with it. It's uh, it's not anything to the degree that the arts fest is, yeah. Yeah. but um, you know it. So I would recommend that you approve this. There's really no conditions that we have. There. I'll make a motion to approve the Axel's Entertainment Permit for the dates that you mentioned. You said the second was was that the 29th? No, you said 24th, July 20th and August 24th. Okay. All right, James made a motion. I'll second that. Mark has seconded it. Uh, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 <coughs> Thank you. Yep. Horseshoe Club requests for a memorial bench. Yeah, at the last meeting, um, three gentlemen, Jim Touchette, uh, Chris Touchette, and Mike Manning were here uh, to uh, present this to the select board. You didn't have a quorum, so we didn't meet and they didn't make their presentation. I talked to the three of them, took it, and told them that unless they heard otherwise, I didn't think they had to come back. So what the uh, Horseshoe Club would like to do, and they play horseshoes up behind the fire station in Waterbury Center in the uh, Oak Davy Park, and they would like to erect a bench I'd like to put it um, uh, just beyond the first two trees as you go in. I think we can work with them to put it in a proper location. Uh, they'd like to uh, construct, pay for this bench. They're not going to construct it. They'll buy the bench. Uh, they'll pour the concrete pad. They'll install it. They're just looking for permission to have it there. And what they propose it for is that it will be a memorial bench and that as members of the Horseshoe Club pass away, they'll put little, little plaques on the bench with, with their names. Uh, right now, <coughs> they would have plaques with the names of Dick Atwood, Patrick Raymond, and Sue Thurston on to the bench if you approve it. Um, you know, it's a six foot long bench. It's, uh, it's made of that composite recycled material, so it shouldn't need maintenance. Uh, no painting will be required. Um, black uh, legs, I believe that, they're metal legs. Is it going to be anchored in some fashion? Yeah, I think they'll anchor it to that, to that concrete pad. I did. Is there a concrete pad there now? No, they'll install it. I did have a. Uh, 
uh, yeah. uh, resident uh, make mention to uh, this request over the phone there. Uh, I returned a phone call for something other town issue. Uh, and it was stated that the concern was that uh, she didn't mind the fact that we were having these benches put in for different people uh, and different issues, but she was more concerned about the variety of the different benches that were taking place in same areas, and she was a little concerned that they it may look a little bit... Uh, What's the right word? Hodgepodge. Uh, yeah, if they were all completely different, and she was suggesting that uh, maybe if if there was one style bench that they could consider, uh, rather than like you said, a hodgepodge of different types of benches going in these parks. Uh, um, well, that's so. that's clearly up to the select board. Um, my recollection is. That we have a memorial bench out here in the in the ward garden um, for Paul Reed. There's a memorial bench for Brian Linder's son in the in the gazebo green in Waterbury Center. And there are two benches up there. There's actually another bench for Emily Mateer. Yeah. Okay. And I was uh, part of a group of people that raised money for that. And the person who spearheaded it who picked the bench doesn't live in town anymore. And it's actually become an issue because it's a marble bench and it doesn't have a concrete base. Um, it would be nice if it did. It has pieces of marble that were acquired by one of the parents. Uh, Emily Mateo was a grandmother and a daycare provider. And when she died uh, rather suddenly, uh, a lot of parents got together and raised the money for the bench. So the bench now, I believe that was 18 years ago. And I, I did talk privately to um, Don Schneider, because he was one of the people involved last summer, because it's starting to get a little bit um, imbalanced and leaning on one side. It's, it's just, it's because of the supports on the bottom, and one of the legs isn't straight. So here we have a privately donated bench, and it's like we have to figure out how to fix it. You know, so it's a, Well, on that one, did, did you get permission to put it there? I don't remember that I one. believe so, but it was 18 years ago, so. Uh, I remember Brian Linder is asking, and or the Linder family, and I remember Paul Reed saying, now this one, I don't remember that one. Yeah. So yeah. maybe it's out, stuck it out It's there. in the center of the green. Yeah. And you're the gazebo. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, that's that's something that we can So maybe talk we do about. need I mean, a policy I, I, of some sort. I expressed concern when we put this one out here for Paul, not that we were gonna be putting a bench that was honoring Paul, somebody else was paying <coughs> for it, but you know, there's five thousand people in the community. How many right. memorial benches, you know? Um, uh, there's a new one gonna be going in um, for um, but Messier's son, I believe, up at the Newton Baker Mini Park. In fact, it may already be there that the Baker family is putting in. So it's just, you know, how many can we accommodate as well as should they all be the same? Right. Well, I think she was making mention, too, that uh, down at Rusty Park here, the benches down there are all similar. So. Right. Well, the benches at Rusty Parker Park were purchased by the Rotary. They were... I think they were actually made in Waterbury, weren't yeah, they? Steve, there was Steve a Slayer, bench company uh, here. Yeah. yeah, and they, you know, it doesn't make them anymore. Yeah. So. Right. Well, maybe I could just add, um, I've been working with Jane some on the Triangle and other areas, and for better or for worse in Waterbury Center, I think we've set the precedent for more variety of benches than uh, anywhere else in town. I think, um, you know, certainly with Rusty Parker Park, I think the consistency of the style is important. Um, there's actually another one up at Hope Davy Park that's around a maple tree that uh, was built uh, for Harold Grout after he passed on that surrounds the tree. So we have a wide variety of benches. Um, personally, I think it's great to have benches, great to have places for people to sit. This is nice that it can, they can add people, so it's going to be one bench and they can add more people. 
But uh, I do think we've already set the precedent of a variety of benches, uh, and it's hard to get away from that at this point. The two in the triangle are very different from each other already. So. Uh, yeah. It was brought to my attention, so I think it's a valid yeah, concern. Sure. I think it's one of these issues where we already kind of have this precedent of a hodgepodge. Uh, you know, unless we want to try to have just wooden benches at at uh, at Oak Davy Park. This has a wood appearance, which I think is good, and we might keep up that kind of wood like. Well, I, I think Oak Davy. I think maybe we should approve this, and then you know. You're the planning department, and yeah, we help out in the parks. It may be some proposal that we want to put together for the future if we have more of these requests. It yeah. Maybe you have recommended yeah. styles you have, you know, that uh, work together. They're not identical, but they kind of are right of the same so, family. I guess I would recommend you just I would. I would make a motion to recommend the approval of the bench. Can I add that back, Chris? Sorry. Yep. I'll second that. Right. Motion's been made and seconded. Uh, is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, would you please say aye? Aye. 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 A uh, request to submit a grant application to the V-Trans Bike Slash PED program for additional funding for Colbyville Pedestrian Crosswalk Project. Okay, so Barb and Steve are going to do most of the presenting on this. I'm going to kick it off, though. Um, we had a fairly protracted conversation about this back in 2017. And we decided to go forward with the project, and um, I, I was going to make this presentation for the benefit of Matt, but he's not here tonight, so um, you all may remember this. But uh, we came to the board uh, back in 2017 about um, following up on a study that we had done for bike pedestrian access between. Uh, the top of Stowe Street and uh, all the way up to Colbyville, and uh, you know there was a there was a, a good study done then. You know, identified different segments of sidewalk that could be installed and put a price tag on them by segment. I think there were five different segments or something like that, um, and it was pretty high uh, dollar price to do all of them. And at the time, we had a, a price estimate of about two hundred and forty dollars or $250,000, I think, to do the sidewalk from uh, basically from the top of North Street to get across the uh, bridge on Stowe Street, the narrow bridge where everybody thinks the bus is going to crash into the <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> get you up uh, across that bridge and then across to the other side, across Route 100, with a short spur up to the Shell Station. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we pitched that um, as uh, really kind of the linchpin of that project, because getting across Route 100 safely was kind of the critical element, regardless of whether you were going to that service station or ultimately trying to get up to the, uh, the new Fairfield Inn. Um, so we came to the board uh, this budget season to include um, work on this particular project. And we were working with AOT at the time, and we had just uh, entered into an agreement with Stantec to do design work, and we had decided to do basically the preliminary work. Uh, so we budgeted $23,400 in 2018 for this design work to be done. Uh, you know, the AOT process is uh, sometimes a, a bit cumbersome. We got a grant to do the initial basis of design, if you will, the conceptual study, and then we have to use a different engineer, go out uh, and solicit a price there. So we worked with Stantec 
and we had a project twenty three thousand four hundred dollars to um, to do uh, some of the work toward that project and it was going to be paid out of our infrastructure CIP fund eighteen thousand seven hundred and twenty dollars of a of a grant from VTrans and forty six hundred and eighty dollars from <clears throat> from us uh, sometime earlier this year uh, Stantec was here reviewing the scope of work with Alec Tuscany uh, the municipal engineer with Barb with Steve and um, you know they had a project that was quite a bit higher than we had budgeted for uh, and we had asked them to scale it down to fit into this budget would do it in phases uh, VTrans came back to us then which was now after town meeting and said you've got to do the entire design uh, we're not going to fund part of the project and take a risk that you won't do um, you know won't finish that design so if my estimate is right we were up into the 40 ish thousand dollar range maybe a little higher than that um, stantec now has reviewed this project and what was once um, described to us <clears throat> as uh, a project that would include uh, preliminary design, final design, well, final design and construction uh, was, we based that, uh, it was a $242,000 project and we were gonna be paying about, I guess it was 60000 to do the design element this year and then probably two years down the road we would do the construction. Um, Barb will tell you in a minute, but the cost estimate to design and build this now is 400000 instead of 242000 So it's more than doubled in price. Um, and I want to be upfront with that right away. It's a project that is uh, heavily grant funded. It's 80% uh, grant funded, so 20% would be our cost. But we were thinking that our 20% would be 20% of 240, and now it's 20% of 400 is the estimate right now. So uh, $80,000 instead of about $40,000. Is the other 80% available from VTrans? Well, um, we don't have a grant for the entire amount, and that's why Barb and Steve are here tonight. Okay. So they're going to talk to you about the, you know, uh, what we need to go forward with this project. But I want to be clear from the beginning that the project has exponentially increased in cost, um, and you know there was concern expressed by the select board when we went forward with this project. And I pitched hard that we should get it done because getting across Route 100 is really critical. Um, it's never going to get any cheaper, and the grant money um, is there. It's never going to cost us less than 20%. But we have other things in our infrastructure CIP this year and in future years. So I just want to start with that. Before you ask questions, Jane, I yep. think it would be best let Barb and Steve walk us through the project, but that's that's where we are right now. Well, that's quite a lead-in. <laughs> um, I think we're all surprised at the increased cost of the project, and just to start out of the gate, <clears throat> um, Bill talked about the cost of the final design. We had originally budgeted 23000 and change for that, and the bids came, or the bid came in from Stantec for sixty-two thousand at the time, and that has since been reduced to fifty-seven thousand. Um, so, <clears throat> the part of it is because VTrans and its federal money requires a lot of different steps to go through. Um, this particular project to get up across Stowe, well, up Stowe Street and across Stowe Street, and then go around the um, infrastructure that's there, <clears throat> there's a, um, I don't know what you call it, the controller electrical for the controller for the signal. There's a sewer line that's under the ground that goes under 
um, Route 100 and then comes out on the slope that goes down into Thatcher Brook. Um, there's a lot of things going on in that particular corner there in order to get a sidewalk through. And then Woody, uh, Bill Woodruff has been involved in this from a long-term maintenance issue, so it's got to be <coughs> plowable and maintainable. So the engineering costs were way higher than were expected. Um, the project estimate came in from Stantec. We were hoping to present this to you two weeks ago, but there, there was not a meeting at that night, and we were still putting the numbers together. Um, the grant source through VTrans, it's the bike and pedestrian program, they have had so many different communities come back to VTrans to say, we initially had this project scoped out. These were the initial estimates. That's what we put in for. In order to actually do it, it cost more. So this is, um, they've developed a grant application specifically for what we're running into now, which is called an application for additional funding for the same project that we came in for a year ago. Um, the application process is a lot simpler because we've already provided the background information. Um, it's simply a cost in engineering and um, actual construction. So um, with the, um, if we go up to 40,000, the town would be on the hook for 20%, which is 80,000. Um, we talked about it today and we've been talking about it internally on that, but um, Alex, portion of his time for project management on this is an eligible item for 20% or well 20% local cost and 80% federal cost but the way we can shift it is that um, of the if, instead of breaking it down by element the whole thing we owe 80% if we can uh, we can document Alex time on this for his in kind time it, the estimate on that is um, 39000 over a two-year period because he's part-time working on this, and that the town would actually be uh, contributing 41000 in actual cash over a two-year time period, and all of that would be next year, not this year. Right. And, and to correct myself a minute ago, so Barb uh, was, uh, reminded me in her presentation, who was the firm that did the first, you know, five yeah. phase. Uh, yeah, remember? that was uh, broad, <clears throat> broad Reach Planning and Design, Jim right. Donovan and uh, Lamero and Dickinson was the engineer. So they identified that this project uh, where we're talking about would be a $240,000 project and that the engineering would be about $25,000. And that, um, that would get you up to the mobile station. No. And the crossing Route 100? No, the Shell no. Station, no. Not the Shell to the station. mobile station, just up Stowe Street and then across Route 100 to the Shell Station. So it doesn't include? Yeah. She's got a copy. Doesn't, doesn't include, include to the mobile station. Oh, okay. That would be a future phase after this. Right. Well, if this is going to cost $400,000, I don't think there'll be any future phases. <laughs> but, um, so, but anyway, I want to I want to backtrack. The reason why we budgeted this year in our uh, infrastructure CIP, we budgeted um, the twenty four twenty three thousand four hundred dollars was because we were going to do the engineering this year, and we had that uh, basis of design which said that the engineering should cost about that. So that's what we budgeted. And then it was after that we solicited proposals from Stantec, and as Barb said, theirs came in at 60000 So my initial discussion with Stantec was, well, we've got $23,000, 23000 and change in the budget. Let's do that amount of engineering this year, and then we'll finish the rest of it in 2019 and we'll be able to budget for it. And that's where the state said, no, if you're going to go forward, you need to do all of the engineering this year. So that's where, um, <laughs> for this year's budget, there will be an impact. And as Barb said, we did negotiate with them and they were able to reduce their engineering by a couple thousand dollars down to 57. $57,000 or so. Um, so the project cost for this year, uh, and I apologize this did not get sent out to you, 
um, <clears throat> includes uh, $56,103 worth of engineering fees, uh, $19,500 worth of Alex time, which as Barb said will be an eligible project cost, but we'll have to pay Alec that, that $19,500. An estimate for uh, right of way acquisition of five thousand uh, dollars, legal fees of twenty five hundred dollars. So in this year, uh, eighty three thousand one hundred three is the anticipated expense. Eighty percent grant would be sixty six four eighty two, and our cost when you net it out would be a little bit more than sixteen thousand um, dollars. Um, I think we can survive the $16,000 uh, hit out of the infrastructure CIP. It's four times what we budgeted. We budgeted 4,600, but we've got enough play there more than likely. Uh, the bigger issue is the construction costs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're looking at, it says 19, 2019, but there's not really an expectation it's going to be done next year, is it? Well, that, that's the whole. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, next year's uh, project would include a little bit of engineering. Um, does this include. <coughs> what about. Uh, oh, construction inspection. I see that's yeah. in there. So, next year's project uh, would include. Uh, $240,000 worth of construction plus um, other elements, Alex time, $48,000 for engineering inspection, some more right of way and legal fees. So next year, $316,897, of which $253,518 would be grant funded, assuming we get the grant that we're asking you to apply for. In the town share next year would be sixty-three thousand three seventy-nine. So um, it it's a big wrinkle from what we anticipated, and I think rather than sugarcoat this and just kind of ask you, well, let us let us apply for this additional grant. Um, it's a much bigger expense, and we should address that now. And talk about it. I'm not suggesting we shouldn't do it. It's just it will uh, impact other things that we plan to do in the future because it's instead of forty thousand dollars over two years, it's eighty thousand dollars for us. One of, one of the other things is I, I would like to have you explain. Um, Steve's been working with the Regional Planning Commission on that bridge, which has been an ongoing issue for quite a while. And Steve, do you want to talk about the study that's going to be done on that? So the, this project, um, it, it uses the existing sidewalk. It fixes that up on the left-hand side of the bridge. But when a new bridge goes in, it, the new walkway will be designed on the right-hand side so it fits all together. Well, I think, um, <laughs> well, it's a feasibility study. Uh, we've been working with the Regional Planning Commission to try to get uh, what's called a scoping study done for the Stowe Street Bridge. And we've been working more recently with uh, VTRANS staff. Uh, we have a project that's um, currently underway. It's the first part of the scoping study. Uh, Stantec is also going to do that work. Uh, it's called an existing conditions study. And um, that will examine the current uh, bridge and um, kind of establish a baseline. And then the second part of the study would be done by VTRANS at a, at a future time. They would do a hydraulic analysis and so on. Um, it really hasn't been determined, I think, um, in follow-up to what Barb was saying. Um, the, the pedestrian um, aspect of the bridge has not been determined. It's a scoping study, so the replacement of the bridge is probably at least 10 years away, even though it's a 90-year-old bridge. So um, I think in fairness, um, you know, we're, we're trying to <coughs> augment the current uh, sidewalk system. It's likely that that uh, system would stay in place um, 
in one form or another, even with a replacement of the bridge. But it, there could be in a, in a different uh, configuration because it will be a completely new bridge. I did have a question about the match. Um, you mentioned the in-kind portion of this with Alex time. So out of the 80,000, you mentioned the 39 mm -hmm. was over two years. Yes. And then, so uh, what would the anticipated cash be? Um, 41. Over 41 two over two years. Mm -hmm. So the, the 80,000 match, as I understand it, uh, this has been mentioned before, almost half of that can be in kind. So uh, knowing that we're paying Alec um, a salary, clearly that's town funds. Mm -hmm. but. I think that's that's one aspect of this uh, that we can keep in mind. Yeah. Is Alec involved in construction inspection? No. I mean, they we're paying for somebody forty-eight thousand dollars for construction right. inspection, and, and they require that. Yeah, that right. that's required. And when Bart mentioned the the many phases of this, um, that's a high number. We realize that it's uh, anticipated to be about a twelve-week project, and uh, it's I believe a full-time. Um, yeah. Engineering it's not Alec. It's it would not be Alec, Alec. correct. Okay. You, you would clarify. be in the design phase, <laughs> correct. Even the roundabout, we had a higher con and, inspector. And while Alec's time is eligible, it's it's not necessarily that the town would be paying him anyway. Alec is a village employee, yeah. uh, and the village pays him, and it's and then he's basically charged out to the projects he works on. So I'm not saying if he didn't work on this project, there wouldn't be another town project that he'd be yeah. working on. It's very well could be, but it, it could be a water or sewer project that he would work on. So, yeah. you know, this is dedicating Alex's time and it's a expenditure of $39,000 over, over two years, the town would be paying the village for that because they'd have to reimburse the village for his time. So it's, it's not quite the same as if it was Steve or me or Byron working on this project where you're paying us anyway and it's just a matter of what we do. What we do. You only pay Alec or only pay the village for Alec if he works for the town and that's not always the case. So it's a little bit different than if Alec were a town employee. Yeah. Okay. So it looks like it's an increase of 158000 That's correct. That's for construction. Well, Plus, oh, and that's in one year, and the second year is 31600 No, no, the, the match is, uh, sorry. The um, total project, the increase is 158000 and the increase in the 20% match is the 31600 so that's the difference of eighty thousand minus the forty-eight forty. Yeah. Yep. That we currently have. So our share for the town that's increased is how much? Thirty-one sixty. Uh, Six hundred. So even though the project is almost doubled, we only have to pay thirty-one thousand. Well, it's not quite doubled. It's it's uh, it's increased by one hundred and fifty-eight thousand from two hundred and forty-two. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Am I hogging this? Did, did you? Yeah. <laughs> there, there should be an extra one right there. Is there not? Yeah, there is, there is one. No. Oh, you got it. Okay. Sorry. It's okay. So I think I think we should tell you that there is a grant uh, deadline coming up for the bike head program, and um, so we we were planning on giving an initial presentation at your last meeting, and then following up with a more detail. But we're compressing it all into one meeting, and uh, the deadline is this Friday. <laughs> is this Friday? So uh, our apologies. We don't like to do this. Um, bringing in projects at the last minute, in but it is we didn't, yes. we didn't have a forum at the last meeting. So uh, we, we um, if you're inclined, um, the request would be to uh, authorize the submittal of the grant application. We realize there's a lot of financial implication, but that's the, um, it's an annual program. We don't know if the program will exist next year. It's likely to exist in some form. We're hoping to keep moving with the project. And um, it, with the Route 100 paving project moving fairly quickly, it, it could yeah. be constructed next year. That's our understanding. 
I, I'm in favor of this. I'm, a, I'm not happy to see the increase, um, but um, I was involved in the scoping. I know this is a pretty complicated area. I, I think we've been trying to get people to safely cross Route 100 for a long time. It's been talked about. Um, we heard at the most recent select board meeting that there's benefits for cyclists coming south who would want to go down Stowe Street. They may want to cross here um, when all of this is project is completed and all the striping is, because it certainly isn't safe for them to continue down straight on Route 100 through the interstate access ramps. So I, I would, I'm in favor of this. I'm the, <clears throat> the only question that I have regarding this is that we currently have the grant as originally scheduled in here, we've got the 242. Um, the amended grant request is contingent upon the application being filed and being accepted and, and granted, correct? Yes. So uh, if, if we do approve um, covering the increased match that's contingent upon receiving uh, that supplemental grant award, if we don't get that supplemental grant award, where do we stand with the project? I think what we'd have to do is um, finish the engineering study for this and wait an entire another year and apply if and when the grant source is available again. But it's likely, if it is available, it would be another whole year from now. And the price would likely go up. <laughs> yeah, what are the chances? We've had some conversation, conversations with VTrans and um, the impression we get is once they commit to a project, they want to follow through and get the project built. They understand uh, that increased costs uh, occur uh, in large part due to their, their process. The high cost of construction inspection, that shocked me that almost $50,000 is just in the construction inspection. But uh, that's the reality of these projects, unfortunately. So I think, uh, I think the chances are good we get this um, enhancement to the grant. There would be a grant agreement that we have to come back to as well. So what does Mr. Woodruff say about the maintenance part of this? The way that they're designing this project, um, and the, the hard part again is that curve on the north side of Stowe Street as you come around the utilities where the um, um, light signal is, and uh, Bill Woodruff um, has looked at it carefully to make sure that the snow plow can get up <laughs> on there, that there's a place for the snow plow to go, or for the snow to go once it's plowed, and then you make the curve in order to take a left-hand turn to do the crosswalk across the road. So um, he's been involved in all of this and has provided input, and Stantec has included that, that in the plan. Yeah, uh, sure, I'll just add, um, the, you'll notice on the design that the sidewalk is all on the road side of the guardrail. Uh, when we did the study with Broadreach and Lamarone and Dickinson, there was some discussion of having the sidewalk behind the guardrail. And that, in large part, is to facilitate the sidewalk plow, not having to navigate through a gap in the guardrail. Mm -hmm. And um, the other good thing about this design, um, maybe it's a little bit of a silver lining, is that it won't require a retaining wall. Um, for the sidewalk um, and that does that detail uh, this is on the uh, north um, northeast side of the intersection before it crosses route 100 and um, Stantec is telling us that that detail with the sidewalk uh, with the guardrail move behind the sidewalk could likely be continued all the way up to Billings Mobile we realize that that's down the line. It would likely be a very expensive project. Um, there is a lot of riprap that would have to be added on the slope uh, down to the brook just to make sure that that's, the slope stays stable. But maintenance-wise, um, there, you know, we're not going to have a retaining wall to maintain. Uh, we will have radiuses on this uh, where you turn the sidewalk plow to make it uh, feasible. Is it, um, <clears throat> did you ask them about the feasibility of 
of putting riprap or fill in the floodplain, which is shown here, stone fill to extend to the riverbank? Well, it won't, it won't add any fill in the floodplain. There'll be some excavation Same elevation. on the bank and a, pl a placement of um, stone to stabilize that bank. There may there may be some permitting through the state involved. But, um, okay. Our understanding is there's no net fill. Yep. Chris. Yes, sir. Make sure it's turned on. Pardon me. Make sure it's turned on. No, you got to use them things on your forehead, I think, probably to see it. <laughs> there you go. Anyway, I sat here as a taxpayer, fairly substantial. I sat here thinking that we're trying to make Waterbury something hasn't been. And with all the other projects, as we look around uh, paving, uh, village sidewalks, and I know there's money in there for that bill this year. <coughs> uh, maybe it's time that we took a good hard look, like most of us have to do in our own lives, that we're not going to do an addition out back. We're not going to do a swimming pool. We're not going to do something else. And I would think that the people of Waterbury had a belly full of the high taxes. And I would think, in due respect to the efforts of trying to get grant money, which is good, but if you want to go back to some of you who weren't even around, when we did Ellingwood Avenue, Stantec did that, and they ended up raising the elevation by what was Leo Bean's house at the time. We put a rock uh, circle around the white birch tree in the lawn. We ended up, before we were done, putting a $23,000 wall <laughs> up below where uh, Mark Albuquerque lives. And I just have a got a tremendous amount of faith in Stantec's uh, accuracy in what's going to happen. We talked about the sewer project to the sewer line which comes across that street. We talked about the hydraulic testing, etc. That bridge is a menace, but I would highly recommend to the select board that they take a very long and serious look for this. And I don't think we totally know where we're going to land if we decide to jump. With that said, I would encourage you to not do it at the present time. We haven't got to do everything for everybody. It's time people started doing a few things for themselves. Well, I kind of had let the other board members there kind of have a stab at this. And I just, you know, looking at the project, I understand to some degree the necessity for it. Um, but as Everett just mentioned, I'm concerned about uh, what we're actually getting ourselves into. Um, I spoke with Bill Woodruff just the other day uh, in reference to a couple of the paving projects that we're going to be involved in this year, hopefully. Um, <clears throat> and I also asked him about uh, Loomis Hill and uh, if there was any information on the cost of that project after this year from the bridge up to complete the project. Uh, he said he was going to dig up that information for me and what I was trying to do is I was hoping to get the board to, to start to take a look at what next year might look for us um, as far as expenditures. Because um, every time we, you know, the meeting we had a couple of weeks ago in reference to the walking path, um, I don't think went over well for a lot of people. Um, but it, the reason that I said the things that I said was in anticipation of yet another project like this coming to our table. Um, when we have so many of these other things that we know are going to be laying in our lap, they're not going away. Um, I understand that a municipality or government is not supposed to operate like a business, I guess. They're, to some degree, 
are hell bent or, or the way they're designed, they operate in the red. But that doesn't mean that we have to continue to deepen ourselves into more and more red. Uh, it'd be nice if we could be different than everybody else and maybe take a look at the projects that we know we got coming, somehow deal with the funding on those, uh, try to at least stabilize how much responsibility we have and how much debt we are going to incur in the future. We've done real well in the last three years through some luck and, and uh, good management to uh, keep our, our municipal tax rate at an even keel. Uh, but heavens knows that that's not going to stay that way, I believe, next year. We're going to have to, I would think we're going to end up looking at an increase uh, with all the things, all the infrastructure. Every time we take away from what we've put in the infrastructure now, it just kicks the can on the projects that are aging on us at a more and more rapid rate every time a year passes. The road gets put down, you know, get, gets ignored again. Uh, before you know it, we're going to have a pile on top of us that are just going to cost tremendous amounts of money. I want the board to be aware of that. And the other issues that we know aren't going away, like the ambulance service. So I won't belabor this issue. Um, it's the board's decision to decide whether or not they want to move forward with this. Um, and I guess we'll vote accordingly. I don't. I don't understand. No, is this just the segue into getting us into more responsibility and more cost down the road? I know. Jane, you'd like to see it go all the way to the top of, of. Uh, well, that's what the scoping report was for. I think. Yeah. I think tonight I, we should just. You know, the, I mean, we, it, that was broken this, into five this segments. This is, this is segment next. one, and I think, I think at a minimum, I mean, what Bill said was maybe we won't build the other segments, but I, I feel that this is a critical intersection. We've got new residences, new apartments on the other side of the road. We have a hotel. We have people who want to walk from that hotel down to our village, and they can't safely walk down the street. Well, at least they could cross the street here. Uh, you have a whole neighborhood up on Blush Hill, and there's no way for children to walk to school and have a pedestrian crossing. And I actually think it's irresponsible not to put a, a, a crossing in here for pedestrians. We've been talking about this for 15 years. I'm not, and I'm, I'm not sorry saying it costs I disagree more money. with you, Jane. I'm, not, I'm sorry. You know, I, I'm very un, unhappy to hear that. I don't, and I don't like to see, you know, cutting down trees in the floodplain along the river to avoid a retaining wall, but that probably costs a lot less money. But I just, I mean, I just think it's irresponsible. And with all due respect, Everett, I, I think moving forward, we have a, a taxpayers and, and property owners that have children and families that would like to cross the street to go to our school. It's part of safe routes to school. And we don't, ha we don't have a, a signalized intersection at now, which is one of the most important and busiest intersections in our town. So I think if we don't build the rest of it, that, that's for the future. But I, I, I think it's a shame to turn our back on this intersection. Question, doesn't the school bus go up plus you? Doesn't the school bus, school bus go up over under? So why are our kids walking to school? Well, let's not get too distracted. I, I think um, I think it is a safety issue. I think uh, this there are people who would like this to This particular walk intersection, I think um, we are going to see um, increase over time in pedestrian access. We're seeing more and more all the time. So um, I think we should focus on this intersection. I think the the prospect of future facilities in Colbyville, um, again, I think cost is going to dictate and, and priorities. But I think we've, we've uh, decided this is an important intersection. And um, we've, E-Trans is investing a huge amount of money in the Route 100 project. Um, I think this is relatively small um, piece in the big picture. Um, we're getting a lot of additional tax base in the Colbyville area. 
Um, and I think this is uh, my my personal <laughs> view is that this is this is an important improvement. I would tend to agree with Bill. The future phases may price themselves out of the realm of the possible. And and I do want to stress. Um, <clears throat> $80,000 is a lot of money. Could we use $80,000 for a little bit more sidewalk, uh, as Everett suggests, or a little bit more paving? Yes, we could. $80,000 one time is, you know, <laughs> tax rate. And we can, we can find this money. Uh, I think I understand what you're saying, Chris. I disagree that we're in the red. We, we don't operate in the red. If you don't like, if you're going to say debt puts us in the red, well, then all of us I'm are saying, in the red. What I'm saying is, yeah, responsibilities that we know we have, we don't have the money to afford all to do those right now. Right. That's that's what I mean by operating in the red. It, I don't take on responsibility at my own household that I know I don't have the money for right now. I think I think we all do, Chris. We all have mortgages. We all borrow money to do the things that. We that as a as a tool it's it's manageable and it has been manageable and i think you you said that um, I, I don't want to get that's a philosophical discussion you and i can have that outside of this this room i'm not saying i disagree with this I, i'm having a tough issue tough time you know saying well the frustration I'm, i have, I have a tough times saying that I disagree with this, okay? Because uh, I don't necessarily no, disagree I, I with this you. particular project. What's the frustrating part to me is that we paid good money to somebody not long ago who said this was gonna cost $242,000. And, and I think that's where we need to put pressure on the state. Why are you making us spend this money, even if it's grant funded, to, to have these preliminary assessments done. And they basically, it seems to me, they're always lowballed because then that gets you to the next phase. And, and we would be much better off if we could just go out and use the grant money to build something as opposed to study it, design it, design it again, restudy it. That's the frustrating part to me, is that we had a competent person that we paid state and local dollars to who's off by a order of magnitude of two times and it's it's i've always said right along that that you know the problem with the tax system is we're taxed to death they take our money into the system it goes through the grinder and by the time it comes out to actually do the work a pittance of what has been taken from us is left to do the work. That's why in a lot of situations, we're in the condition we're in because the large amount of the money is eaten up, like you just said. Uh, and yeah, don't get me going. Do you only uh, get one S, you've hired Stantec now to do the, I mean, how did this work? Is, was this competitive that they gave you this, this cost estimate? They or, or are they on retainer and, and you only have one engineer? We had a choice of several. They're called at the ready ATR consultants who have been vetted through VTrans. It's a VTrans process, and because Stantec has done all the engineering for Route 100, they're doing the engineering for Main Street. They've done the engineering for the roundabout. They are very familiar with engineering for our water and sewer systems. We, yeah, we have. They had data that if we hired any other firm, would have to go out and redevelop that data. So we actually had a savings by going with these engineers because they had that at their fingertips and were intimately knowledgeable of this intersection, of our community, of this area. So maybe if they had done the scoping report, it would have been well, accurate. There's a, <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of ifs, right. but I, you know, the um, this grant that is due on Friday, this is the very first time that they're using this new uh, additional funding application through VTrans because of the same situation where all of these grants that have been given to communities after a scoping study has been done have been coming in. Um, underfunded um, for the process that we're being asked to go through. And I don't dispute, you know, when the money goes into the, our taxes go in and when it comes out and what happens to it there, 
but this is an opportunity for us to do something that is safe for the pedestrians and the bicyclists who use this area. Um, this has been in the plans for a long time to do something, the, a pedestrian access for this area. And at 80% funding, it's not going to get any cheaper. I guess I'll say this last thing in closing, that um, with the reconstruction of Route 100, the uh, in increase in the population in the town, more and more people, uh, eventually uh, the reconstruction of Stowe Street, perhaps, um, probably this particular project should be a part of all that uh, to kind of complete the safety issue. And uh, I understand what you're saying, Everett. Trust me, I'm right there with you. But for this particular project, I'm going to have to say that uh, it's probably a good idea. I reluctantly agree with you. Okay, so somebody wants need to need a motion make to a authorize the grant application to be yep. submitted. Yep, and probably uh, you may have to sign it. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve the uh, request for additional funds. Is that That's right? Yeah, an authorized bill to sign the grant application. Yeah. Don't put a amount of money on it. <laughs> you can can't exceed, accept. I'm going to put it, I'd say, as it's recommended here in this uh, written proposal that was outlined. You don't have to do that. Because it's, it's a great it is what it is. We have, you know, we have to use the numbers that we have. I'll second the motion. So you will consider second it. Okay. Uh, motion's been made and in in seconded. Uh, no further discussion. Seeing none, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Reluctantly, aye. <laughs> Thank you. I, I want Thank you to know how difficult it was for us to come back and ask. Um, we didn't like this process at all yeah. either. So well, I'm Thank you. shocked to see 48000 to inspect a project. Yeah. It, it was originally budgeted at twenty three. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe we'll save 80000 somewhere else along the line. By the time the budget budget is done, let's hope. Okay. Yep. Sorry. Reservoir for uh, grant <laughs> agreement, an MOU between the town of Waterbury and friends of the Waterbury Reservoir for greeter programmer. So the good news here is that there's um, there's no local tax money other than Bill and my time reviewing some documents. So this is a pass through. Um, I am going to uh, pass out a memorandum of understanding, and then we can discuss this hopefully fairly quickly. This was all in the prep documents from last time, right? Is that, um, get this? this is this is money that's uh, coming in through a grant provides for. Staffing a, a greeter. The greeter at the uh, Waterway Reservoir ramps, correct? This is uh, part of the state's program t for um, aquatic uh, nuisance vegetation control. Yep. Uh, this is a project, this is the third year that the Friends of Waterway Reservoir has had this program. Uh, they applied for a grant and uh, got some additional funding. Um, the total grant is $2,563, and um, they also have a generous grant from the High Meadows Fund to uh, match this plus um, some of their own funding. So they're actually going to have a supervisor and uh, I believe two greeters uh, part-time on, on the weekends. So uh, there are two pieces to this. Uh, one is that we have a grant agreement. Um, we didn't provide you with a copy because it's about 21 pages, but Bill and I have reviewed this. It's the standard agreement that outlines the, um, the funding from the state. It comes to the town. It's a reimbursement program. Um, we make two requests that are outlined um, in the memorandum of understanding, two installments. And um, 
You can read that under um, the Friends of the Waterbury Reservoir will. Number three explains that. So um, again, there, there's no um, financial contribution that the town makes other than some staff time to um, work with them. They do all the preparation of all the backup information for the submittals to the state, all the reporting, and we um, make the requisitions to the state. Uh, once the money comes in, we uh, cut the check, or Carla um, signs the checks that go to the uh, Friends of Waterbury Reservoir. So I think what we need in this case is um, one motion to um, authorize Bill to sign the grant agreement for um, funding for the Waterbury Greeter program, uh, and then uh, perhaps second motion that will authorize Bill, or you can put it in the same motion, that's up to you, that authorizes Bill to sign the Memorandum of Understanding between the Town of Waterbury and Friends of Waterbury Reservoir. I'll make a motion to approve both items that you just mentioned. <laughs> okay. The bill to sign. For this agreement. I guess. I'll second that. Do you, do you have that, Carla? Okay. Uh, Jane made the motion. Mark seconded it. Any further discussion? All set, Jane? All set. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Great. Thank you very much. Okay, Steve. Thank you. Okay. Down to the last couple here. Hubbard Farm Road Culvert grant funded project. Grant, grant, grant. Yep. Um, so again, in our infrastructure CIP, we had um, culvert for Hubbard Farm Road. It was estimated, excuse me, to be a $50,000 project, uh, $10,000 local share, $40,000 from the state. Um, we had applied for this money in 2017. It was in our infrastructure CIP last year, and we were not able to get, uh, get to it. Um, the grant allowed the project to be done th through the end of 2018. Uh, we received a bid, well, we received three bids. Um, Austin Construction was the low bidder at $60,555. Kingsbury Construction was $84,175, and ECI was $87,000. Um, the $60,655 that, uh, um, that Austin bid includes um, $5,000 worth of guardrails. Um, it's, um, it's pretty steep. It's on Hubbard Farm Road, which is a dead-end road. It doesn't service a lot of vehicles, but um, I think the, call, the uh, guardrails should be there. Um, we could take the guardrails out and only be you know, $5,000 above our estimate uh, and then do the guardrails later at some time ourselves, but I think that's frankly less cost effective than just having Austin do it while they're there, as opposed to us having to go back later. Uh, so I, I would ask that you authorize me to uh, sign the uh, notice to proceed with Austin. He'd like to get going sometime in July, I think. And uh, the grant, the maximum grant amount here is 40000 so we, we have to keep the, the rest. But uh, it's a project that, um, you know, we were required to get a hydraulic study by the, um, by the state. The culvert has to be designed for flows and to allow AOP, which is aquatic organism passage. Uh, so, you know, it's a higher end project than in the old days. We just stick a culvert there that's you know, three feet above the screen there. Right, I know about those. Right. Ultimately, they're much better projects, but it requires yeah, more, care, more care to do it that yeah, way. It takes a little bit more money uh, up front, but yeah. in the end, it's a better project. So um, 
I would recommend that you authorize me to sign that. So I'd like to make that motion then. I'll make that motion to authorize Bill to sign the grant agreement. Also Not the grant agreement. Not the Notice to proceed. Notice to Notice proceed, to proceed the proceed contract with the contractor. For the price of the low bid. Okay. Mark, you seconded that? Yep. Okay. Any further discussion? Is that a better roads grant? Uh, I think so. I think so. Thank okay. you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Police contract. Did you get my email late this afternoon? Uh, yeah, I just looked at it quickly. Most of your issues I can give you answers to. Okay. So, um, so anyway, we have uh, a contract with the state police that uh, Mark and I have been working with um, the state on. And what's her name? Major. Ingrid Jonas. Is she a major? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I couldn't remember her last name. Um, it's easy to remember. <laughs> anyway, uh, I think we reported a couple of meetings ago that Mark and I had met uh, with folks from VSP, including uh, the colonel back uh, a couple of months ago, started this process. Uh, there's been a lot of back and forth with regard to this contract. and. Uh, and the state's lawyers had to get at it at the last minute, and they made a few changes. Um, I suggested in an email late this afternoon that, at worst, the select board would um, would approve uh, this tentative agreement, allowing us to iron out a few minor details. I think they're minor, but um, I did include Mark and Ingrid. Uh, in that email and had made a couple of specific comments. Um, this, the first comment had to do with that the town of Waterbury must abide by the Vermont's personnel and policy procedure manual. And I'm a little reluctant to do that since it's not our personnel and procedure manual. Yeah, the, uh, the link I shot you on that take, take, <laughs> takes you right to it. But in essence, it's, it's pretty much standard uh, in, in employment practice confidentiality. You can't release their social security numbers to the public. You can't do this, you can't do that. So it's nothing uh, really out of the ordinary. And the reference link is available through the DHR website. And, uh, I did shoot you that uh, that link, so okay. if you have any trouble getting to that, the um, the other item, uh, the 20 BSA 1923, that relates to their internal affairs process, and the internal affairs process is uh, confidential and uh, just works within that guideline. So it wasn't anything that's onerous for us to have to deal with. Great. Um, I thought it was a little overkill that we had to have a written agreement for them to start earlier than um, the block. Uh, uh, yeah, well, I'm glad you bring that up. See, the, with their work contract, and I don't think it's changed, but we, in scheduling, uh, the schedule for the next month has to be posted no later than the 15th of the previous month. Uh, otherwise, there's compensation, overtime compensation that's that's available. So all that's going to be is when we figure out where we want to try to plug that in, just an email note, they'll put it on the schedule and, and that'll be that. Okay. Um, it's, uh, it's just, they're still uh, under the provisions of their collective bargaining agreement, so that's, that's why that has right. to be. Well, I guess my point was I didn't necessarily think it needed to be up to us to decide that on, you know, Tuesday, October 14th, we want the guy on at 6.30. I, I would just think that the troop commander and the trooper who's assigned to that shift can communicate and say, hey, it would be a good idea if we're out it's, it's, on the road before such and such yeah. a time once right. in a while. It, it, it's going to be pre-scheduled in, so it's, it, it's not that difficult to work with, but it's just bureaucratic okay. stuff. Okay. Uh, 31 years of dealing with it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then the final point was just about um, 
writing moving violations on town ordinances? Yeah, that language we had put in, and um, there was a residual part of it that remained, but not all of it. So I'll, I'll make connections with her tomorrow on that and see if there's a particular issue around that. They, they did keep part of our language in there, but it, it wasn't as descriptive as what we originally had in there. Right. So I, I think we can just circle back and touch base on that. Yep. So to remind the board, um, we voted at a special meeting in January um, to enter into this three-year agreement with the state for uh, police coverage 80 hours a week. <coughs> it's uh, $365,102 a year for three years. There's no escalator clause in here. So it's, it's a fixed cost for three years. Our cost for 2018 is going to be half of that 365 because we're on a calendar year budget, yep. but yep. it's presumed that we will roll that forward going into next year. So yep. we'll spend uh, 182 or something like that yep. this year, yep. and then in uh, year two and three, well, year two we'll pay the full amount, and then depending upon year three, it's supposed to. It will stop in July of that third year. We so, we, cr we cross four of our years and three of their fiscal years. Right. So That's anyway, works. Um, I think calendar mm -hmm. overlap. Everything that I've seen in this, uh, I can recommend that the select board authorize me to sign this on behalf of the town, with the understanding that there's a couple of minor elements that we just have to. Uh, you know, tweak the language on a little bit. I don't think it's anything major, those issues aren't anything major that I have to come back here. If, if in the process of trying to fine tune it, it turns out that I think it's major, I'll just say, well, I can't sign it until I have another board meeting. So, and that will require a special meeting because <laughs> we need to sign it before July 1st, so. Question, do you think that they can bill that they would not be covering on weekend, or did I misunderstand you? Um, you have, uh, so the, there's two shifts, Everett. Uh, there's a day shift, which is Monday through Friday, essentially 8 o'clock in the morning to 5 in the afternoon. Yeah. And then a night shift, which is 5 in the afternoon mm -hmm. until 2 in the morning, and that's Tuesday through Tuesday. Saturday. So on Mondays, including Saturday. yeah, until 2 o'clock in the morning on Sunday. But no coverage during the day or overnight Sunday until Monday morning at 8 o'clock. Well, more detail and, on and, it tomorrow And then, night. of course, you know, <laughs> everybody uh, tends to forget that while we're not going to be paying <clears throat> our money for these two dedicated troopers. If something happens on a Sunday and, and there's a call, the BSP in Middlesex is going to respond to it. Yeah. So it's not like we don't have coverage. It's just that these dedicated <coughs> troopers, they don't work seven days a week. I just want to clarify that. I knew what you were saying, but I want to be sure. Yep. So was, was there any reason for the rest of the board to have the ability to review the contract or do you I mean I'm going on the assumption that what you just said is I, I am trusting that you guys have got this all kind of taken care of um, that's not typically the way we do business, but well, I thought we had sent it out. I'd never seen not anything. well, not the not the final version because we didn't get the final version. Oh, the final version, but I yeah. thought we had distributed. Yeah. It seems like it's been quite a while. Yeah, well, it's been a while. If you want to take a minute to read it, you're more than welcome. Is it just that short? Yeah, it's uh, it. it well, I don't want to. Um, it's already 10 minutes of 10. Yeah, minutes. no, the, uh, the bulk of it is the, the uh, first few pages just talk about the establishing the working relationship and everything. And we talk about the, uh, the hours and scheduling issue that we've already talked about here. Uh, the payment schedule is going to be on a quarterly basis, so 
each quarter we'll pay 91,000 and change for the, uh, the contract services. And what they did um, was instead of front loading all the equipment costs, um, we spread that out over the three years. So the accelerator that Bill was talking about, they, they actually did um, uh, accommodate for the increase in salary, rate of salary, going uh, from year one to year two to year three, but that's all blended in with the equipment costs and everything else. So we came up with a, that 365,000 uh, a year. Over three years. Yeah. Yeah. So if the contract gets signed tonight, when will the equipment start to be? Well, there's, there's no equipment. We don't. We're well, not buying. We had to supply. No, no, no. All, we're, all there, we're paying the expense of it. So in the contract, in the 360, show him. Uh, well. Yeah. Show him that table so on page six. Are it, but we're, yeah. we're, they're dealing with it, right? They're, they're, see, in order to get the positions we got, um, that we're basically providing the funding for two new positions to be added to the total overall. So it'd be and, yeah. so, so in year one, you've got the expense of all of the outfitting stuff and everything else, and that's, that's blended into this. And then... Um, over the course of the three years, you know, most of that um, equipment has got uh, pretty good shelf life other than the, the car, but all the other equipment and everything right. uh, will carry over from year but to year. The, the idea of it is that we worked on it. <laughs> We're responsible for that equipment, but we've basically amortized it through the payments on a level funded basis over the three years. Yeah. If next year the voters at town meeting say we're not going to fund this anymore, you know, we'll and we have to cancel the contract, say the first of June or the first of July, we can do that. There's an out clause, and we don't have to pay for everything. But that equipment that they're monetizing over the course of three years, we would have to pay them for that to get out of the yeah. agreement. Yeah. And um, we, we left it such that either party uh, can get out with a 30-day notice if there's a need for doing that. We um, negotiated in provisions for um, extended absences. So if they have um, one of the troopers gets reassigned, uh, breaks a leg and can't work, and they can't replace that position, um, there's a 10 working day uh, block that will will accommodate, and they, it, if they don't fill it at that point, it relieves us of the obligation of paying on a prorated basis. So, um, their commitment and the thing that will make this work is to keep Middlesex's base staffing up as much as possible, and these two uh, new positions are that extra icing on the cake, as it were, and if if their staffing drops so low that they have to pull somebody in, we've got the ability to uh, um, adjust our our payment obligation until such time as they can they can fill it back up. And we'll look at it year to year. Uh, they're going to report for us on a monthly basis, um, and we ask for a litany of uh, performance items that they're going to report on. Monthly and, and annually. So, um, yeah. Though the blue light activity on Main Street has been much, much more than what we've seen in some time. <laughs> Everybody's getting adjusted. They, uh, uh, they have identified uh, the two troopers, and, and Bill met one of them already. Um, and as soon as we get this all signed, uh, the new station commander started last week, and so he and the troop commander will be meeting with us for the initial discussion stuff and have a look at um, potential office space set up for the troops. And uh, So it's moving along. It's several weeks behind where we wanted to be, but they had to transition with their station commander, and that kind of pushed stuff uh, onto the back burner for a bit. So are we still going to make the deadline that we were hoping to make? Okay. Yeah. yeah. As long as the state government doesn't shut down. <laughs> yeah. 
Thirty-three. Five there. So, yeah. Jane, would you like to make a motion? I'll make a motion to approve this agreement. What's this called? Question. This yes. contract, the police yeah. service contract with the town of Waterbury. There has been. Uh, Hang on. I'll make a motion for Bill to sign this police service contract. Okay. Has there been a second? I'll second that. Okay. Any further discussion? Ann. Uh, there has been several days a week during rush hour in the evening a trooper uh, in front of the fire station on a regular, you know, semi-regular basis. Huh? Good, good. They, um, they have always been comfortable with the working relationship here in Waterbury. And I, I think um, uh, in, the, in the end, this is all, all going to strengthen that, that relationship. And it's going to be good to have the consistency of the presence, um, not only in the village, but throughout the town. Yep, yep, I agree. OK, motion been made and seconded uh, to sign the uh, contract. Uh, with subject to maybe an authorized, authorized bill to sign the contract uh, with potential for a couple minor changes um, for the state police contract for the town of Waterbury. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 <clears throat> Last thing, Bill, budget report. Yeah, and that's all we're going to do. Um, the investor. <laughs> portfolio review and investment policy review uh, is really for the benefit of Matt. Uh, we'll wait until he's here to do that. This won't take very long. Uh, this is the budget report through uh, April. Uh, actually, I think it's through May. So I hope I yeah, January through May. May. Yep. Yeah, okay. um, I did update it since uh, the last meeting was uh, canceled, I was able to update the numbers. So right now, everything looks pretty good. Uh, as always, revenues lag. Uh, we don't get most of our revenues until the second half of the year because most of our revenues are property taxes and they're not billed until July and we don't collect them until August. Um, we are doing pretty well. Uh, the town clerk's fees are ahead of schedule right now. If we continue to collect town clerk's fees at the rate we have through the first five months, uh, we'll, we'll collect more than 65000 It's projecting out at seventy eight right now. That might be a little high. Um, our revenues for recreation programs are doing quite good, and I expect they'll ramp up even more now that we're ready to start uh, the seasons there. Um, uh, even um, planning fees, uh, we're ahead of the game there considerably right now. Um, We'll see. I, I don't think it's going to be 29. I may have not updated that third, that fourth column in every instance, but we're we're ahead of schedule um, right now. And investment income to date is pretty good, uh, but there's a long way to go before the year ends. On the expense side, um, there's nothing too concerning right now it's looking like the general government spending is going to be over um, I didn't analyze this completely as to why it may have to just do with the fact there's 53 pay periods in the year and my formulas are a little bit out of yep. skew with the calendar um, I think if you turn there's no pagination on this I apologize but if you turn to uh, Maybe easier to count from the back. One, the third page in from the back. <laughs> uh, you'll see there that um, we budgeted for the general fund two million six hundred ninety-eight thousand. We've spent five hundred eighty-four thousand to date. We've spent twenty-one, almost twenty-two percent of the budget. Uh, we're through 40-something uh, percent of the year through May. 
And we're projecting out to come in really right on budget, 2694 And again, there's a lot that can change in seven months, but right now we're on pace to, to be on budget. The highway department as well, which is the next page. Uh, again, we're, we're showing right now, projecting out, that we'll be a little bit over on that, but it's always difficult to uh, to make a projection at this time of year because there's so much winter uh, variability in the project. You will we'll notice, however, that I uh, put in bold uh, the gasoline and diesel fuel uh, costs. Um, prices have gone up some. I, I included, I think, a 10% uh, cost increase in the price of fuel when I did the budget. Um, and we still have plenty of room that we may come in under on those two line items. But the reason why total spending for highway right now is projecting that will be over budget is for the gas, the diesel, and the salt line. And I don't think we'll spend 65000 for salt. Uh, winters typically have been starting later. We don't seem to get any snow before deer season anymore. Um, so it's usually just the month of December. Um, and then in the last page is just the library. Uh, that is uh, kind of going just according to Hoyle. I don't know if I reported to the select board, but um, Mary Kasamatsu, the library director, has uh, decided to retire. She gave me her official letter today. She will be retiring as of August 31st. Um, we'll work mostly through July, and then in August, she'll, she's got quite a bit of vacation time to burn through, uh, but she'll be finishing August 31st. And the reason why the library budget is looking like it might be over budget right now is that emboldened third line from the top, health insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary doesn't take health insurance. She's covered by her husband's plan. Yeah. Uh, it's likely, if not inevitable, that the new library director will probably yeah. need health insurance. So um, that, that may throw a wrench into things a little bit. But all in all, things look pretty good. I don't know if you have questions. I did have this sent out, so it, had some time to look at it. If you have questions now or later, you can email me. Um, but I'm happy with how things look for the moment. Yeah, I looked at it back when you first sent it out. Um, I had a couple minor questions, but they weren't anything that were a big concern. So I'm happy if you're happy. All set? All set. We make a motion. Motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion. I'll second that. Okay, all those approve. Aye. 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 10 o'clock. 10 3.